Is it, would that be okay, or? I guess so. Can I? Yeah. Well, I think because there's, I think because there's so many of us, what we're gonna do is just have you come up each one at a time, and then at the end oh, with good. the Q and A, oh, you all come up oh, and sit So I don't think you have to sit up here or I'm stare at the audience. Right? You may, you may sit up here for Dr. Torres's presentation. Um, Where am I? We are going to get you on here right now. Oh, I'm not on there yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How are you? Again. Good to see you again. Try you again. That's okay. his, okay. his thing. Yep. Give him his little cap. Try it again. Then we'll have our entire collection. <laughs> Good morning, Jeff. How are you? Hello, how are you? Billy Carrish. Oh, really good to meet you. You too. Thanks so much for coming. Oh, thanks for inviting me. So we getting you all set up here? I think so. If you go down, it says mm -hmm. Woodrow Wilson, just like everybody else's. Um, Even further down? That's the bottom. Oh, they're in order of... Um, Date, maybe? No, they're ordered by type. Oh, there they are oh, typed. Oh, there it is. Yes, no problem. So then we'll rename it. So how many does that give you, Paul? Does that give you five loaded We've got the complete five. set. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. They're all on the desk, desktop, ready. Right? You just need to open them up. And there you are. Slideshow, view yeah, show, which is, which is, your mm -hmm, okay. that's your control. Or F5 will give you, you the that. full screen and the arrows. I love that. And so, back to the start. I'm just going to close it. It'll open Fine. from here. Right. Are you first? Do you know? Do you know I'm who's first? I'm not sure. Set. I Dr. Torres I is first. Either him. Yeah, I believe that. Dr. Torres. Go well, won't we? Won't we just open yeah. his open up? up. And at least we'll have a nice slide. And then, of course, this will be up here. I'll give you back What's your that? stick. This is the remote control, mm. the other part of the remote control that goes in the computer, and this sends a signal to it, ah, yes. so that it that. it'll it has a little laser pointer on it, yeah, okay, and also it can advance your presentation backwards and forwards. Excuse me for a sec. Okay, okay so I'm gonna. You you can you can sit here and then. Um, what sure, when we load up, I'm Osterholm. Yes, so I'm already right. on here. So, All right. there you go, sir. Just, Thank I you. run it off here. I will, Somebody I will come up here and put it up. Um, if, if you would like, it's no, very you, you easy. You can tell me what to do then. Sure. sure. Hi, Mike uh, Osterholm. Hi, oh, Billy Carrish. Good to see you at last. <laughs> <laughs> Your reputation precedes you by far. <laughs> uh, Mr. And Austin. it's wonderful. Uh, You're uh, right here. I, got you right there. I don't have these really That's in fine. order. I, as long as I see it, I know how to do it. If you see your name, That's right. I, got it. I, know, I know how to do it. Yeah. Okay. Once I, okay, you got it. Good, 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 good. Yeah, I did another one here. Yeah, so good. Oh, yeah. Are you uh, oh, good. Yeah. So you're coming to Minnesota, what, next week? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Actually, I'm going to be back out here again. Oh. <laughs> We're hanging in there. Yeah. So,
Okay. Uh, a hearty welcome. Good morning to all of you. My name is Mike Van Dusen. I'm Deputy Director of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and a special welcome to you. Um, we feel at the Woodrow Wilson Center that this collaboration today with Cornell University is extraordinarily important, and we're very happy this event is taking place. We are the official and living memorial to our 28th president. We are a public-private institution getting roughly 35 percent of our resources through an appropriation from the Congress, but raising 65 percent of the money we need to keep this place going. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was the only president we ever had who had a Ph.D. He always felt that you had to bring the world of policy and the world of ideas together. And you had to bring the scholars and the policymakers together. And you hope through their dialogue that uh, better policy will emerge. Each will learn from the other. So we look at a meeting in terms of getting the right people into the room. Although the U.S. government is not here officially, um, we feel we have a good many of the right people in the room to discuss a very important problem. So I welcome you, a hearty welcome. I hope you'll come back to the Woodrow Wilson Center again, and I want to thank Cornell University for helping to make this program possible. I turn over to Je Dr. Jeff DeBelco, who runs our environmental security and change policy at the center. Thank you for being here. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the center. Let me second Michael's uh, welcome. We're thrilled to be collaborating with Cornell, as Mike said. It's, um, it's been tremendous. It has really uh, brought a whole different uh, set of expertise and, and, and contacts into the Wilson Center. We're thrilled, Alfonso, uh, Alfon Dr. Alfonso Torres, who's really been our, our uh, intellectual leader in assembling this program. We're very pleased to be uh, discussing today uh, a session called Critical Dialogues on Avian Influenza, bringing together the public health, animal health, and wildlife management communities. This meeting is the second uh, that we've had here at the Center on Avian Flu. We were lucky to have one of our panelists today, Mike Osterholm, uh, uh, address an audience in this room back in September. So we're thrilled to be trying to understand and wrap our arms around this um, uh, amazingly complex uh, issue and try to understand what the potential social, political, economic implications are. 
So as an issue that really impacts us all, no matter what our portfolios are, uh, we're very lucky to have such a distinguished panel today to help us better understand that. I want to give a short preview of um, yet another meeting uh, close on the heels of this one, really gaining some momentum. Uh, Senator Tom Harkin's going to be visiting the center on December 7th uh, at 10 a.m. to address avian flu issues as well. So we look forward to that and hope that you will all join us for that as well. Uh, to get us started on uh, a rather full agenda, I'm going to um, just very briefly introduce our speakers and then turn the floor over to Alfonso to get us started. Uh, their full bios are available out on the table, so I will keep it um, uh, hopefully not insultingly short given the um, distinction of all of, all of our speakers. Um, I will, what, what we will do in terms of stage managing, we'll, we have uh, five speakers. We'll have two with Alfonso kick us, kicking us off a, a little bit of discussion and then have the subsequent three and then have a whole discussion with all the panel up front. So that's just how we will proceed. I do also want to welcome our uh, online audience because this meeting is being streamed live and you can um, come back to it when it will be archived on the Wilson Center website in short order. Uh, Dr. Alfonso Torres is currently Associate Dean for Veterinary Public Policy and Executive Director of the New York State Animal Health Diagnostic Lab at the College of Veterinary Medicine at Cornell University, which you really have to take a deep breath to get, to, uh, to get through that, um, but it gives you a sense, as I said, of the distinction. Uh, prior to his current position, Dr. Torres served as Deputy Administrator of Animal and Planet Plant Health Inspection Services, APHIS's uh, veterinary services program from 1999 to 2002. Uh, following Dr. Torres will be Dr. Um, Billy Karish, who ha is, has directed the field veterinary program for the Wildlife Conservation Society, WCS, uh, since its inception 15 years ago. Uh, he also chairs the uh, IUCN Veterinary Specialist Group, a network of wildlife and health experts around the world. Um, really one of, one of, if not our leading, the world's leading um, environmental NGO. So it's a, it's a real honor for him to be chairing that group. Um, working in poultry medicine for the past 30 years, Dr. Buzz Klopp, our third speaker, is currently corporate veterinarian for Townsend's Inc., a family-owned broiler chicken company with corporate offices in Georgetown, Delaware, and operations in Arkansas and North Carolina. Uh, he, uh, Dr. Klopp serves on several USDA liaison committees and has a, a whole range of activities with various scientific and professional associations ranging from the American Association of Avian Pathologists to the National Chicken Council. So we're thrilled that um, that Buzz in the private sector perspective can be at the table today too, uh, a critical perspective, one that we don't necessarily uh, hear at the table in many of the discussions we've heard so far on avian flu uh, in the media and otherwise. Uh, Mike Osterholm, Dr. Osterholm is Director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. He's Associate Director of the Department of Homeland Security funded uh, National Center for Food Protection and Defense and professor, professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota, another another mouthful. Uh, in June, Mike was appointed to the newly established National Science Advisory Board on Biosecurity and uh, prior to his current position served for 24 years in various roles in the Minnesota Department of Health. And then uh, last but certainly not least, Lonnie King, is, Dr. King is the Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine at Michigan State University and Professor, professor of Large Animal Clinical Sciences. Uh, prior to his appointment, Dr. King was administrator for the Animal and Planet Health Inspection Service, APHIS, uh, at uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and currently is serving as director of the Office of Strategy and Innovation at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. So, Alfonso, I'd like, with that introduction of our speakers, to turn the floor over to you for the first presentation. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thanks for the center for giving us this opportunity. Uh, to uh, share with you some of the uh, different dimensions of avian influenza. Thank you for the speakers, my colleagues, that accepted the invitation to come in, and uh, it was quite a challenge to find uh, time that we could do this together. Uh, so I'm very glad that we all arrive on time uh, after the storms and the bad weather in the airports last night. But, uh, what we want to do uh, is to set up a environment here in which we can share with you some of the different dimensions of avian influenza. And we expect 
from you to participate with your questions and your, your comments. Uh, this conference will not be a success unless you participate in this as actively as, as we can. Uh, we want to highlight different uh, aspects that uh, affect the potential of this disease to uh, continue to affect the animal health, but also uh, the potential for the impact on human health as well. And, and also we're going to share with you what is the international impact the, the, the of this disease in the commercial poultry operations uh, in the U.S. And, and abroad. Also, we would like to give you a window into what is happening in Asia right now, and is this going to be repeated here? Uh, what are the uh, common on, on different aspects of the dimensions of this disease as it's happening right now in Asia and, and what could happen here in the United States? But most importantly, we want to emphasize the need for all these different sectors to be very well coordinated. This is going to be a, one more example. We have had examples before, and you're going to hear about that. Uh, West Nile, SARS, monkeypox, uh, you name it, uh, in which animal health, wildlife health, human health, uh, and the private sector were all involved into these things. And unless we work coordinated, uh, we're not going to be able to deal with these issues in, in a proper way. So the, the plan is to have all these interconnections and interdependencies highlighted to you uh, in these different four sectors. And uh, so hopefully each one of us is going to bring a piece and uh, together in the, your minds and in our minds we'll put it all together and uh, come up with some uh, better appreciation of the different dimensions that are no not always highlighted as we hear the highlights in the press and the sound bites uh, in many of the media organizations. So. so let's start with what is avian influenza. Excuse me for a second. Because we talk about avian influenza, bird flu, but do we really know what it is? And uh, so that's the purpose of, of my segment here, it's just to highlight to you what is and, and perhaps what is not avian influenza. And by the way, influence, influenza is an old term from the Middle Ages. Uh, uh, the Italians coined this term for this disease that thought to be an influence of the stars. And that's the name of influence. And I wonder how much of what happened is the influence of the press and the sound bites as well. So it continues to have a relevance in the name. Uh, all of us working in infectious diseases and epidemiology like to talk about this triad, that in order to have a disease, an infectious disease, in this case, even influenza, we have as a minimum these three main factors, the, an agent, a host, and an environment. They all need to be working together in order to have disease. Just having the agent by itself is not enough, or having the host by itself is not enough. So when you hear about people afraid of consuming or touching chickens right now, it's, it doesn't make any sense because, you know, they are healthy. They're just chickens. And, and, and so I, I want to highlight uh, things uh, one at a time for you. So let's start with the agent. Uh, and this is a complicated agent. First of all, they are, we're talking about in avian influenza type A, uh, orthomyxoviruses. Type A... It's have to say A that connotates that there are other types, and indeed there are types Bs and Cs. But Bs and Cs are happening primarily only in humans, and they are not subdivided in many subspecies like happening with type As. Uh, so type A is the, the main one we're going to be concerned about here, and uh, they happen to have in these uh, virus particles you see in the electron microscope a little fuzzy projections out in the, in the surface. Two of those proteins in the surface are the hemagglutinin, or H, and there are 16 of those, or the N, and there are nine of those. So you could have viruses, avian influenza type A viruses, that have a, any combination of them. So in essence, you can have 144 possible uh, H and Ns. And that's what gives the, the, the name of these viruses. Like right now in Asia, it's the H5N1. So... That is, that is a, a big, big part of, of what we're talking about, that we have a tremendous number of, of avian influenza out there. So which one are we talking about? That's part of the, the, the question here. Now, two important concepts, you're going to hear this in the other presentations of my colleagues, is what is called the antigenic shift. 
and this is an abrupt change into the composition of the, these surface proteins of these uh, viruses. And that happens if a cell gets infected simultaneously with two different viruses. And in the diagram, let's assume that a cell gets infected with an H6N5 and at the same time with an H9N2. These viruses have segmented uh, a genome, a genes that are in fragments, and those fragments recombine, and then we can end up with an H6N2 that did not exist before. So that is what is called antigenic shift. Many of these reassortants uh, occur in the, in the, when we mix populations of animals, and we're going to see that highlighted here, how uh, the number of uh, infected chickens and the people and the pigs and the wildlife, and uh, they all get uh, involved in this uh, uh, shifting and uh, reassortment of gene segments and new uh, strains are coming up. The, the other important concept is what is called antigenic drift. Now, a drift is a slow process uh, that takes place uh, due to the error that this uh, enzyme, the RNA polymerase, when makes a new copy of the nucleic acid of the virus, makes some errors. Uh, but in RNA viruses, uh, virology, uh, the errors are not corrected uh, uh, as readily as in DNAs. So eventually with time, uh, these uh, genes change. So consequently, the protein uh, produced by that gene, it changes with time. And I try to illustrate that with those bars. We have an H3 protein, but with time, the hues of the protein, the color, so to speak, changes. Now that may uh, take months or may take years. Uh, now. One thing is those changes uh, happening, and the other thing is the ability for those viruses that have the change to be established, to be selected. And that depends on how, many, how much pressures we have in, in the virus to be able to, to sustain its replication. So not all those viruses that are a result of the shift get established, only those that, that have the least amount of resistance so they can remain in the environment. This is one of the reasons, there are other reasons, but this is one of the reasons why the human vaccine is uh, uh, reformulated uh, on a yearly basis, because uh, an age three of three years ago or five years ago is different than the next year. So that, that is why we need to continue to adjust those vaccines to uh, the, the variations in the theme. Let's continue to complicate uh, matters for you, and that is that when we talk about avian influenza viruses, and this applies primarily to avian influenza viruses only, we have two different types. We have what we call the low pathogenic avian influenza, LPAI, and we have the high pathogenic avian influences. Now, the low path are the majority. I mentioned about 144 potential combinations. The majority of those are low pathogenic avian influenzas. They uh, live mostly in uh, migratory birds, waterfowl, shorebirds. We'll talk about that in a minute. And they produce enteric infections. This virus can only replicate pretty much in the intestinal tract. And the disease consequences are very, very minor, if any. But also we have the high pathogenic ones, which for the most part, uh, almost 100% of them has been H5 or H7s. Uh, but not all of them. Uh, there are many H5, H7 that are garden variety, low pathogenic ones. But at least some of them have the propensity to shift from change from the low path to the high path form. And now they can grow in all the tissues of the body or the birds, and they can produce very uh, severe systemic infections with major disease consequences. So keep in mind uh, those uh, terms because we're going to be go back through uh, uh, some of our talks into these two concepts of the low pathogenic avian influenza viruses and the high path. Now, how that change happened between a, a low path and a high path uh, is in part because any avian influenza, or actually any influenza for that matter, uh, that H protein needs to be cleavage, needs to be cut at a certain place for the virus to be able to replicate in, in, in cells that are infected. In the low path avian influenza viruses, that enzyme that cuts that protein is present only in the intestine. So this virus can only grow in the intestine. If the virus penetrates uh, the body, they don't have the proper enzymes to make it grow, so the, the infection is confined to the intestinal tract only. However, if that hemagglutinin site uh, has changes 
due to a drift. And, and the number of basic amino acids in that area, designated here in this uh, diagram with number one, and become more and more basic amino acids. Now there are many other enzymes in the body that can cleave that protein. So now this virus can replicate and, and multiply in the chickens in practically all the tissues, thus producing a very systemic severe infection in the, in the chickens and the birds and the high mortality rate. So we have seen that happening, uh, that some of those H5s or H7 that are low pathogenic suffer that mutations and then become highly pathogenic. So let's talk a little bit about the host for a minute. The natural reservoir of all subtypes of avian influenza viruses are uh, birds. Now, the most frequent birds having these uh, viruses are the waterfowl and the shorebirds. But also gulls, terns are very common. Occasionally we have other marine birds, uh, upland game birds, ratites, these are the uh, ostriches-like birds, that can be occasional uh, host also for these viruses in nature. And rare or unknown, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, interest in these, other birds like cranes, especially songbirds because they are in our backyard and so forth, and raptors. But for the most part, we are concerned about the waterfowl and the shorebirds. Now, just to give you an idea, in the waterfowl, we have four families, 48 genera, 161 species. And these are all the ducks, geese, swans, the screamers, and all those uh, birds. And in the shorebirds, it's even larger group of birds. We have 14 families, more than 60 genera, and more than 200 species. And those include the killdeer, plovers, and lapwings, and so forth. So the notion that we're going to control and el eliminate avian influenza out of nature doesn't make any sense. But yet, as perhaps Dr. Karish will in, uh, inform us, there have been some functionaries in some countries of the world that say, let's wipe out avian influenza out of the wild population. Good luck. So that is where the reservoir of, the, of these viruses are. So we have this reservoir here uh, in which all these uh, H and N uh, genes are mixing and, and exchanging, but really nothing happens in those birds. Uh, um, they just is part of the normal flora, so to speak. Now, what we're concerned over the years is that these uh, viruses can move and affect the species, and we have the uh, evidence that over time, and this is probably hundreds of years, uh, virus has migrated to horses, not all H types, but you can see the numbers there, to mink, to whales and seals. Uh, and then on the other side, we have uh, pigs and domestic uh, fowl, in which these viruses have not only moved from the genetic reservoir, but also been mixing vessels. And out of those mixing vessels, they can pass it to each other, including us, humans. And, and, and the new event for humans that is going to be highlighted also by my speakers, uh, is the fact that we humans have not had experience with an H5. Mostly in humans has been H1, H2s, and H3s. So the, the, the fact that we have now a new age coming into uh, us is what one of the many factors that have us concerned. You're going to see this diagram by other speakers. But I want to highlight that recently in our lab at Cornell, we found that the equine uh, flu virus has jumped into dogs. So is this, what is this going to, is this going to be a mixing vessel? Is it going to go from the dog to other species? We don't know yet. Uh, but it's been a significant finding that now we see an H3 from the horse uh, jumping directly, totally, to the dog, and now we have that circulation in dogs. What are the common domestic hosts for avian influenza are the the poultry. And when we talk about poultry, and, and uh, Dr. Klopp is going to talk about it in more detail, we talk about chickens and turkeys for the most part. Uh, so that is the common domestic host for the low path or the high path avian influenza. If it's low path, it's not much of a consequence or very little. If it's high path, it's major, major consequences. So what are the consequences uh, in, in the poultry? It depends on many things, the age of the bird, the species, the virulence of the virus, other infections, and so forth. But in the low path, generally speaking, we see relatively little. There are sleepy chickens, uh, some respiratory sign, lower productivity, uh, and, and the like. But it's really not, not a big uh, uh, issue. The big issue is when we have the highly pathogenic avian influenza in, in birds. 
This is so-called the foul plague. And as you can see by the name, uh, it is a serious disease described a long time ago, uh, 1878, way, way before the human influenza was described, and is characterized by a very sudden onset of high mortality rate. The disease happens so fast that you may not be able to see a lot of clinical signs. What you end up seeing is hundreds, hundreds of uh, birds uh, dying. Uh, they are depressed. They may or may not have some uh, uh, nervous signs, and they end up dying, showing a very severe face edema, accumulation of fluids in the in the face, uh, like this picture in the wattles, and they come, and then the hemorrhagic lesions in the skin of the legs and then internal organs. Quite severe. Uh, we have these high path avian influenza uh, episodics before. Oh yes, and, and here's a list for the last 50 years. So this is this is what is is a rare o occasion that is given all the amount of avian influenza virus that we have in nature. Uh, it doesn't happen that often, but it happens in enough uh, with severe consequences uh, uh, that, that we are very concerned about that in the, in the uh, animal health field. Uh, we have, for example, now those, those uh, uh, cases here in red are cases in which the outbreak is started as a low pathogenic, and yes, we saw it causing some degree of disease, and then there was the, the mutation, and then those viruses came high pathogenic with a lot of consequences. Just to give you an example, in 83-84, this was the outbreak uh, of avian influenza in, the, in the, uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, it cost to the United States economy about $65 million, 17 million birds are killed. Uh, then the, probably the largest uh, episodic we have in the last 50 years is what we're having now, 1996, probably even 1993 from Korea. There are some people that feel starting in 93 to the present. This is the H5N1 that we have now. And then you can see other outbreaks in Italy, Chile, Netherlands. Uh, the last case of uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza was last year, a small outbreak in Texas uh, with an H5N2 in, and uh, now, it's interesting that that uh, outbreak in Texas, H5N2, was at least the same destination of H5N2 that happens in Pennsylvania in 82, but because of the shift, is, uh, the drift, excuse me, the viruses are not exactly the same. They are classified the same, but they are not exactly the same. Now, what we are seeing now with the current outbreak of uh, H5N1 in Asia is that we are getting into new hosts. And... Uh, it has been found that uh, in a cluster of domestic cats in Thailand that they were sick and dying, and indeed it was due to this H5N1. And then experimentally has been reproduced infection in cats. Also was a very sad story uh, about tigers and leopards in a uh, preserved breeding center in Thailand in which about half of the population, they have about 400 plus animals of tigers and leopards died. And they died because they were be feeding dead chickens from this outbreak. Uh, there was a good way, perhaps uh, somebody thought of, recycling this protein and feeding these animals to uh, the big tigers, and they get infected and, and then die. It seems that the domestic cats also die by consuming contaminated uh, raw meat from infected birds. Now, there is a, a promed uh, little blurb that perhaps the civets, and we remember civets with SARS, uh, may also uh, be uh, a species that is... Uh, uh, potentially uh, affected by this uh, new strain of avian influenza. So the range of, of uh, species is, is widening. Another uh, new host for this uh, strain of avian influenza has been as humans. And the first case was documented in 1997 in Hong Kong. In that case, there was an outbreak uh, associated with live bird markets in Hong Kong, and uh, uh, six out of 18 sick patients died and they control it after killing about 1.5 million birds in the city of Hong Kong. Uh, subsequent, we have seen a different, different virus on H7N7 in the Netherlands in 2003. There were about 83 uh, 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 people that were infected. Many of them have conjunctivitis, not, not a very severe conjunctivitis, but one individual happened to be a veterinarian working with the outbreak uh, died uh, of the infection. And then the, back in Hong Kong, 2003, the same H5N1, uh, two uh, individuals sick, one died. And uh, uh, Canada uh, last year had an H7N3. There were 
some minor evidence that perhaps uh, some humans got infected with that uh, uh, virus. And of course now we know in, in Asia that several countries in this uh, current outbreak have had uh, individuals, uh, uh, humans, uh, infected. And, uh, but so far, in all these cases, uh, there have been a direct connection between birds and humans. Uh, there has not been any uh, strong evidence of human-to-human -human, uh, transmission, uh, and, 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 and that, that's good. That is one of the many different uh, concerns about this virus uh, changing into a pandemic strain. It, there will be a sustainable, efficient transmission between human-to-human. Now, the fatality rate uh, right now with H5N1 is, 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 is high. It's 68 out of 132 uh, individuals that have died. What we don't know is how many are infected. Now, we know, so the denominator is not quite clear. So we know that the fatality rate is high. Fatality rate meaning those that die that are sick. But we don't know what the mortality rate is. Mortality meaning those that died of the total population. Because we don't know how many people are infected. Now, we know with flus that many of us get infected. Nothing happens. Some of them may seek medical attention. These 132 were hospitalized people, and of those, uh, about half of them died. So we still have a lot of unknowns about what are the effects of this virus in, in people. But certainly the fatality rate is, is, is quite high. Now, we also have seen some new manifestations of this virus in waterfowl. I mentioned to you a minute ago that these viruses in waterfowl do not do anything. Well, this highly pathogenic H5N1 does, and there have been fatal infections uh, in domestic ducks, uh, and also encephalitis and fatal infection found in wild birds. And I'm sure Dr. Uh, Karish is going to talk to us a, a little bit more about that event. So that, that is sort of a new characteristic of this uh, virus, uh, and uh, that's why we are concerned also about the uh, migratory birds in many ways. This, this is a, a table. Uh, I know it has a lot of numbers and maybe difficult to read, but I just want to uh, highlight that this is the same H5N1 isolated from many uh, wild species and, uh, and do experiments in, in ducks. And so if you go from the bottom up, the, the oldest strain tested in this experiment was 1997, and uh, no mortality of, of experimental ducks inoculated. And you can see that eventually uh, isolates, the more recent isolates from uh, last year and this year, now they are killing the animals. So that shows that, that that sort of drift that this virus has gained some pathogenicity that was not in before. And, and again, that's part of the concern about what's happening in wildlife. What do we know about the immunity, uh, about these uh, avian uh, flus uh, in poultry? Well, we know that uh, those animals that survive infection develop immunity. So we know that then, if that is the case, then perhaps we make a vaccines. And indeed, we can make vaccines. And if the vaccine needs to be tailored to each subtype, particularly to the age, I mean, ideally, you do the age and the N uh, matching. But at least if you match it to the N, uh, antigen, then, then you can have vaccines. And in the animal world, we have uh, kill vaccines, uh, whole virus vaccines, and then also we have some live recombinant vaccine that contain only the H antigens. Now, still the challenge for us in the, in the, in the animal side is that there is no current uh, U.S. vaccination program. Uh, actually, there is no vaccination uh, practice for avian influenza in, in poultry in, in most countries of the world, although there has been some in the Mexico and Italy over time. And uh, we only have a supply of emergency vaccine, and that vaccine will be used in case of an outbreak, and I'm sure Dr. Klopp will talk perhaps a little bit more about how we'll go about using uh, that in the commercial uh, poultry operations. So let's uh, move a little bit to the environment, because this is probably the, one of the most complicated parts, and that is go back to uh, what we know about the ecology and epidemiology of these viruses. We talk about the circulation of the low-path avian influenza viruses among uh, uh, the natural reservoir in, in, in water, fowl, uh, short birds, and the like. Now, from there, this virus has adapted uh, to chickens, and uh, circulating chickens as a low-path avian influenza with relatively little or no consequence. Now, the reverse doesn't happen. Once this virus gets adapted to chicken, it doesn't go back really to the wildlife. Uh, but these low paths 
as I mentioned a minute ago, through some mutations can change into a high path form. And that high path, especially the H5H7s, they circulate uh, producing disease in domestic poultry. Uh, once again, this uh, virus is already adapted to commercial poultry in the past, what is known, had not gone back to the natural reservoir. So it's been only one way. What is new now is that there's been a readaptation of some of these uh, 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 strains of H5N1 and infecting wildlife, and that's why we have seen some mortality in, in wildlife, and some of those birds carrying this high path, even influenza. So this is, this is a, a conceptual uh, uh, ideas of how the ecology and epidemiology of this uh, high pathogenic avian influenza, at least this strain, we don't know if this is going to be repeated with other strains, is, is, is happening right now. Another part of the environmental issues, and uh, I know Dr. Klopp will uh, touch more about this, is what is uh, the risk of uh, uh, contracting avian influenza in the, our commercial uh, poultry operations. If you have highly technified uh, production, like we have in most uh, farms in the United States, uh, with bio barriers, uh, biosecurity, on farm biosecurity, the chance of uh, the risk of these birds acquiring avian influenza from the wild, from the outside, is very low. Uh, people shower in coming into these poultry houses. There's a, a lot of practices. Why? Because we have suffered these diseases in the past and we have learned from experience. Now, the, the, the risky operations is these backyard open uh, operations in which these uh, animals uh, in the wild are going to be potentially in contact with migratory birds and so forth. Now, so happened too that the marketing channels of those uh, backyard operations are not as, as good uh, as the marketing practice of the, uh, the high end of operations. And, and Dr. Karish is going to talk about uh, and show you some, some illustrations of what happened in Asia. So, what I want to say is that what's happening in Asia will not happen here. We don't have the same dynamics of people using birds and commercializing the birds the way they are. Now, it's interesting that all the highly technified farms in Thailand and Cambodia have not suffered even influenza, even though they are in a heavily infected, because they have good on-farm biosecurity. So we're going to have to continue to learn how to do uh, poultry production to try to separate these sectors uh, uh, a little bit more. So the mixing of a species is a, is a problem. It was going to continue to be a problem, and we see that in backyard production, exotic animal parks, and the live bird market. These are areas where we have a lot of avian species and other species mixed together. And, and, and this mixing of species is what happened in Asia. We have a lot of people, a lot of dogs, a lot of pigs, a lot of uh, commercial poultry, uh, all mixed together, and that is uh, part of the problem we have. So changes in husbanded practice, uh, um, uh, production of poultry uh, with low tech, uh, poor on-farm biosecurity, and in essence, back to the nature of farming, uh, are, are going to be risky operations in this uh, uh, environment. Now, I want to highlight, too, to you, and I know uh, others uh, of my uh, colleagues are going to talk about this, uh, is that we are in the middle of a livestock revolution. The livestock revolution started many years ago, uh, and that is due to a global trend on the need to increase production of animal, of uh, pro protein of animal origin. Uh, we have an ever-growing population in the world, and even though there are many poor countries in the world, as the economy of these countries improve, the first thing that people do with a little more disposable income is buy protein of animal origin. They want to buy a little bit more chicken. They want to buy pork or beef. So the production of uh, poultry will continue to increase and is expected to be 40% higher than today by the year 2020. Beef 24%, pork 31. Why poultry higher? Because it's easier, quicker, more efficient to produce protein uh, through chickens than through other species. So the growth of production of poultry in many parts of the world, Asia in particular, has been growing exponentially. With, with not a lot of uh, technology. And uh, so that's, that's part of the problem. That's not going to go away. That is going to continue to be a train to increase the animal population to feed the world more and more. So we're going to see more and more of these uh, situations with all the disease happening. Now, developing countries uh, are going to be generating 60% of the meat and 52% of the milk. 
So that is where the veterinary uh, animal health, public health uh, infrastructures are not the best, and we're going to continue to have the challenge of these diseases popping up more and more outside uh, and uh, as being the, uh, at risk from uh, many factors of those diseases uh, to come into us. We're going to be touching uh, and perhaps talking a little bit more about uh, that there have been severe weaknesses in animal and human health infrastructure. Uh, they've been limited uh, diagnostic capacity. This is, I'm talking about worldwide, but even domestically. Uh, we do not have the best monitoring and surveillance for these diseases, uh, and uh, we have very insufficient research infrastructure and funding, especially in the animal world. I know there have been severe increases, significant increases in NIH, but when it comes to do research for diseases that affect animals for the animal's sake, we only have limited USDA funding to do research and very limited uh, capabilities in research. And yet, the majority of these uh, zoonotic diseases come from the animal world. So I, I am I'm pleading for uh, us collectively to, to be sure that the animal side doesn't get the crumbs of the table when the uh, uh, pie is divided up among the different agencies and programs. But very importantly, and I know uh, Dr. Keene is going to talk a, a lot about this, is that there's a lack of very effective communication and cooperation between these sectors. Once again, what happened with West Nile and uh, the diseases that I mentioned in the past is good examples. We need to do better. I think that we're doing a little bit better, but we need to do way, way, way better in, in being better coordinated, working together. Uh, we're going to be touching uh, also in with, through my other speakers in the, the risk of uh, moving these diseases uh, around the world because we have increased international travel, not only of humans, but also animals. There are jumbo jets um, going across the Pacific and the Atlantic as we speak daily, moving animals. And uh, we move pets around. We move uh, many things um, as part of the international trade and animal products. Uh, many countries uh, and even many states in the U.S. Uh, do not have proper laws. Or if the laws are there, they are not enforced properly. So we want to establish quarantine procedures, mandatory testing, and the like. Many times we cannot do that because there is no enforcement of these regulations. And of course, we are always subject to economic crisis, political upheavals, war, civil unrest. And the first thing that drops in those uh, situations is the animal health infrastructure is lost, and then these diseases popping up and move from one place to the other. And that is a major, major uh, component of how uh, these diseases uh, flourish in many parts of the world. Now, there are other factors that while they are not going to be increasing the presence of these diseases, uh, there are going to be a significant factors in how we deal with them and how we fund them and so forth. And, and uh, there are these societal factors um, we are very concerned about infectious diseases in a way that is uh, difficult to understand. Uh, I think that we need to do better in risk communications. And why are we so concerned about, uh, for example, uh, BSE, uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, when it has only killed 153 people uh, worldwide, when we are losing probably that many people on a yearly basis to West Nile, but we don't think about that. We're very concerned about this pandemic, and rightly so, but yet we are losing uh, millions, two to four million people of malaria every year. But we don't hear malaria in, in the press. So th these concepts are... are, are, are uh, there's also a lack of knowledge about food sources. Food comes from the supermarket. That's it. But, but what is behind that? And, and, and a big a part of our profession is to provide food security and food safety to the society. But that gets lost into the translation, so to speak. And, and, and part of that is a lack of knowledge and appreciation about what is the uh, contributions of, of agriculture to the national economy. We are a very industrialized country. We are very advanced. But yet we are an agricultural country. Our agricultural exports are one of the few positive aspects of the balance of trade in the United States. There are other societal factors. So happened that this year, the year of the rooster, and some have suggested that that had some implications into what's happening in Asia, and I think Dr. Karish will touch uh, a little bit on that too, because uh, in some of the societies, then they honor the rooster, and they have birds at home commingle with them because it's the year of the rooster. Now, how much of that is a factor? I don't know, but it uh, has been a factor. I think so. I think so. 
Now, it's interesting that next year, the year of the dog. <laughs> so are we going to see these uh, uh, fluing dogs now playing any role? I don't know, but it's, it's sort of interesting that next year is the year of the dog. Now, what, we're going to, what are the actions that we're doing here, at least in the animal side in the United States? Uh, we need to continue to enhance the monitoring and surveillance of commercial poultry, uh, light bear markets, uh, backyard operations, and wild birds. And I think we're doing that. Are we doing that optimally? No. Why? Funding. I think we have the infrastructure, but many times we don't have the funding. And we, I'm talking about the whole veterinary infrastructure, not only the, the government sector, but also the state sector and then the, the academic sector and the uh, commercial sector. We need to uh, do a much better job in the early detection and diagnosing of animal health events, whatever the disease is. Uh, uh, 2001, I was speaking to a lot of people about foot and mouth disease. Today, we're speaking about avian influenza. I don't know what we're going to be speaking in two years from now. There's going to be another disease. Uh, we, we, we're doing better in the live bird market testing. And just as an example, in New York City, there are about 90 uh, live bird markets. Uh, this is a place where you can go and choose what chicken or geese or uh, other birds, uh, even goats, you want to have killed on the spot and dress and take home. And uh, from time to time, these low pathogenic avian influences come out of there. The concern is that, like happened in Hong Kong, this mixing of uh, species and people may result in these uh, mutants uh, that are highly pathogenic. So we have a very uh, effective and active fatal state program, and we do a lot of that testing at, uh, at, at our lab at Cornell. But also we have what we call the four animal disease diagnosticians. These are veterinarians uh, from the state, uh, federal government, and also the universities that have been trained at the Plum Island Animal Disease Center in the recognition of these diseases, about 25 diseases. Uh, and they are uh, distributed all over the United States. And uh, I'll show you a map here that that's sort of a general distribution. So the goal is that we can have one of these highly specialized veterinarians in any farm in the United States within eight hours of notification. And except in some places in Montana, I think we can do it. Uh, so this has been a very good system. Uh, so we have a veterinary infrastructure of people that can be mobilized. And I'm sure the public health sector also has something like comparable. But this is just the animal side. But also we have, thanks to congressional appropriations in the last uh, three years, a, a new network that we call the Animal Health, uh, National Animal Health Laboratory uh, Network. Uh, initially it started with those uh, states with a big red dot, uh, 12 labs, in which uh, they begin to have capabilities to diagnose these diseases that prior to that were only diagnosed at two fatal sites, the ones with the blue star, at Ames, Iowa, or Plum Island, New York. So now we have many other uh, labs, many located at, at the universities, like our uh, center at Cornell, that have the ability to diagnose these diseases. So now we can diagnose highly pathogenic avian influenza using the real-time PCR within hours of getting the sample in that two years ago, even a year ago, we could not do. So that's good news. Now, that network is expanded to be able to do surveillance for uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, chronic wasting and disease, and many other diseases. So, so this, is, this is very good. Do we have all the uh, funding and so forth? No, we don't. But we have the infrastructure uh, there to do uh, a lot of early diagnosis, early testing for, for things. Now, I know uh, Dr. Klopp is going to mention a little bit more about that, but we also have some other uh, challenges and some other actions. That is that the World Organization for Animal Health or OIE, used in the old French acronym, is the standard setting organization and the WTO, uh, World Trade Organization, to set up standards for animal health. And they have uh, designated that now any H5, H7 avian flus, regardless of pathogenicity, needs to be reportable. Because we know that some of those can mutate and change into a high path. So that's going to put a lot of challenges. And if you're following the literature, what happened in Canada? Just a surveillance for wild birds detected on H5, and everybody overreacted, shutting them down. Uh, it was a garden variety H5, and we're going to continue to find garden varieties H5, H7s, but we cannot, we cannot risk the international trade just every time that we have a little bit of background noise. And I'm afraid, and not to the press here and elsewhere, that, that we have to be more careful on what to report and the accuracy of reporting 
things, what it is. It's not just avian flu, but what type it is, is very important. Now, USDA has quarantine and the population authorities, of course, with indemnity, uh, in cooperation with affected states. So that's, that's a tool that we have in place. Now, there's a lot of talk about in the animal, in the human sector, or reestablishing quarantines. Uh, but we have had those authorities, that ability for, for a long time and continue to do so, and quite effectively, actually, to stop the outbreaks. Uh, so outbreaks uh, are of avian influenza or, or the diseases for that matter, but in particular avian influenza, uh, are controlled by proper quarantines, stop movements, uh, strategic emergency, emergency vaccination with the uh, emergency uh, vaccine available, uh, depopulation, disinfectant, and then very importantly, restocking and getting the industry back in operation. That is going to be a key key for, for all of us. So I want to thank uh, some of my colleagues that provided some of the slides here. Uh, and um, with that, uh, we're going to hold questions until uh, Dr. Billy Carris is going to come and talk to us here, and then we'll have a break for questions. So thank you for your attention, and Billy. Thank you, Dr. Torres. Um, that presentation really saves me a lot of time in going through uh, much of the material, background material, and I'm going to try to focus my little talk here on um, some of the drivers behind, some of the driving forces that lead us into influenza, and it will certainly touch on these issues and repeat some of the same things that Dr. Torres said. Um, not that we got together beforehand to decide on what to repeat. Um, but I think there'll be some overlap because they tend to be the important issues. Um, so you might hear them over and over today. Um, I actually wear two hats, and that was mentioned in the introduction. One is uh, co-chair of the IUCN, or the World Conservation Union Species Survival Commission's Veterinary Specialist Group. And this is a network, not just of veterinarians, but of health professionals around the world that volunteer um, their time and their energy and their knowledge uh, to help out, mostly in developing countries, but not always, um, on issues related to the health of the environment and the health of wildlife. The IUCN bigger group in the SSC is actually composed of about 10,000 scientists um, that form a knowledge network around the world of sharing information. Um, but the group that pays my salary, so my regular days are spent with the Wildlife Conservation Society, um, where I run the field veterinary program that was mentioned this morning. Um, the Wildlife Conservation Society also manages the Bronx Zoo and the other zoos uh, in the New York area. So we have a lot of experience over the last hundred years with captive wildlife. And as was referred to this morning, when West Nile virus came to North America, it was actually picked up by the pathologists, the diagnosticians at the Wildlife Conservation Society's facilities in New York. And at that time, and maybe... Dr. King will mention that, uh, it was referred to before, about this kind of gap between the, the animal health and the public health sector at that time when the pathologist um, said, this is something very strange, and we went to the public health community, and they said, no, we were crazy. Um, and while that was probably true, um, we weren't wrong. It was a new virus, and it wasn't here before, and it was a new disease. We've also kind of taken that concept around the world and said, what can we learn around the world from this relationship between the health of wildlife, livestock, and humans? So we have the field veterinary program, and we operate mostly, again, in developing countries around the world, where we feel like we can do the most good and help the most people for the fewest resources available. Uh, monitoring and surveillance is a, a routine thing we've been doing for years and years and years, and not for a specific disease. We don't study diseases, um, we really kind of focus on the health of animals and the health of people. So our surveillance programs, this is a shot of uh, one of our vets down in Patagonia in Argentina, um, would include sampling hundreds of birds of all different species and including domestic animals too and running every test available 
um, and seeing what's the background profile, what diseases are out there all the time. So we want to know that. And those change from place to place and from year to year. So we actually have normal values. So when you go see your doctor, um, if you're not a doctor yourself, um, and get a blood test, in about a day or two, or if you're lucky, they'll call you back with the results of that blood test and say all your values are normal. Um, with wildlife, we don't have that. So a lot of our work is establishing baselines. So we do these tests and say, gee, they've been exposed to such and such a virus. I wonder if that's normal. Well, the only way to know that is by going out and doing baseline work and surveillance programs worldwide. Uh, we've been working a lot in Central Africa, and this really leads into avian influenza, though it doesn't look like it does. Um, but because we've been doing surveillance with wildlife in Central Africa, in training local people of how to do that and our counterparts and getting them in, out in the field doing surveillance, we actually found Ebola virus, the cause of Ebola hemorrhagic fever, in gorillas and in chimpanzees and connected that with human outbreaks. And that was only because of good surveillance ahead of time. For years and years, everybody wondered what the connection was. And until people were working in the field, looking at the surveillance of wildlife, could we finally get the connection and make the linkages. And we went upstream. So rather than trying to deal with the disease afterwards by uh, controlling an outbreak, we want to work upstream to prevent outbreaks of disease. And we link this, the Ebola virus, certainly, to the bushmeat trade and the consumption of wildlife. And it's in a huge volume. We're talking about 2 billion pounds a year. Um, hundreds of millions of animals are being consumed in Central Africa. So, and all those animals have different viruses and pathogens which can go into humans. So our upstream approach is let's do some education to teach local people about how they can avoid getting this disease. And there's some nice stuff coming out today in Nature um, on linking also Ebola with fruit bats. So you might see that uh, later this week in the news. And that's the connection with um, prob most likely that the fruit bats and frugivorous gorillas and frugivorous fruit-eating chimpanzees and antelope and even people um, have the, they share these fruit trees and so the fruit bats kind of tie in nicely. So it's really kind of looking at the ecology of these diseases, understanding what's in nature, can give us tools to start preventing some of these disease outbreaks. So that upstream approach, um, I think, is really important to note about avian influenza because while there's certainly a need for treatments, good effective treatments for influenza, and while there's certainly a need for vaccines every year to protect us, um, there's some things we can do before those things happen that might reduce the incidence and the, um, the, how often we see outbreaks of disease, especially influenza. So if we look at Asia, why do all these influenza viruses every year, um, most years, come out of Asia? And it has a lot to do with practices um, that are just common there. And in most of the developing world is quite similar. So as opposed to in the U.S. where we raise our animals sep uh, separately and individually in most cases, um, in most poor countries, animals are mixed and they're mixed with people. So you'll have cows and chickens and ducks and the ducks are eating the garbage that's thrown out of the house. And in the evening, those animals are either brought in the house or live around the house. So you have this constant mixing of bacteria and viruses, which we all have every day. That's why you're supposed to wash your hands after you go to the bathroom. So animals have that too. Not all of them cause disease when they're in their normal host. But as you mix animals, the diseases go from host to host and can change their pathogenicity. If you look at how ducks and chickens are raised in Asia, uh, it is quite different from those pictures we saw before with um, modern husbandry techniques. So this is a common duck farm in Southeast Asia. Um, and we're talking huge numbers. In China alone, we're not talking about 10 million chickens and ducks raised a year, and we're not talking about 100 million uh, or a billion, but 10 billion ducks and chickens a year. So huge numbers in a whole variety of uh, ways of raising them. And mu much of it is still outdoor. So any contact with uh, um, wild birds flying in and out, this is, makes it very easy in both directions. And Dr. Torres made a very good point um, about the, H, the current H5N1. It really does tend to look like it's become pathogenic in domestic ducks 
and then reinfected the wild, almost a pathogen pollution has gotten back into wild bird populations recently. And this is the reason why, because of this kind of um, raising techniques. Another th way uh, ducks are raised, and this is really important in Asia, is they're put out in rice fields after the harvest. So it's a good utilization of the, the waste rice. After the harvest, a lot of rice falls into the paddy. You can put ducks out there. They take advantage of that, and they raise these ducks for maybe a week, and then they're all loaded up and moved to a different rice paddy. So for the whole production cycle, as these ducks are being raised up, um, which frequently leads into Chinese New Year. We talked about some of these cultural uses. There's a huge burst of production, and all these ducks are moved from paddy to paddy to paddy. And of course, these paddies are great places for wild birds to be landing, and the virus lives very well in water. So we've generated this kind of mixing pool um, because of the production systems used. I borrowed this slide from some health folks at Cargill. Um, that's in stark contrast, and as Dr. Torres was saying, with biosecurity management, which takes place here and is trying to grow in the other parts of the world. Um, so these birds are isolated from the environment, and not only is it just the way the birds are raised, but also the transportation. So on the lower right there, you see a truck being sprayed down. <clears throat> and what's been seen certainly in the U.S. is um, vehicles, the marketing system, the empty crates can transfer avian influenza virus around too. I've never seen a truck sprayer um, in a poor village in the middle of Cambodia. So when we're wondering why this disease is spreading around, not only are they moving their birds uh, from rice paddy to rice paddy, but they're taking the market on the back of motor scooters, on the back of a pickup truck, and those hygiene practices aren't in place, so the, the virus can just spread around by mechanical transportation. And as you look at the spread of avian influenza virus across the top of, or the lower part of Russia, um, late, this late summer, and everybody said it was wild birds, it was wild birds spreading it across Russia, well maybe, but the route also you know, followed the Trans-Siberian Highway and Railway. So very likely could also be just the transport of poultry. So we don't know. There's a lot of questions out there. So there's a lot of integrated approaches that need to be used. Dr. Torres referred to these numbers. We're just going to see more of it because the world demand for protein is growing, and it's growing in developing countries. So we need to be really focused overseas if we're going to get this disease under control. Um, Things are great in the U.S., and I don't think there's going to be too much of a problem, if you ask my opinion. But the problem is over the transom. It's outside our borders right now. And if we want to protect ourselves, we really need to be focusing um, where the source of the problem is upstream. And that has a lot to do, as I mentioned before, with cultural practices. And this might be the year of the rooster photo. Um, but certainly, there are. we have to come to grips with not everybody having the same relationship with animals that we might have here in the United States. A lot of practices lead to disease transmission. Um, in the United States, cockfighting was the cause of a huge outbreak of Newcastle's disease in California. I think it cost $100 million to clean up. So who bore the price? of that. Who paid that hundred million dollars? Well, we did as society with our taxes, not the people that were doing cockfighting. They didn't pay the hundred million dollars in damages. They just made their profits from the activities and then we all had to chip in to pay for the results of that. So we really got to get strict about control and in Asia that's going to be tough because this practice is really common and these birds are moved all around and they're worth a lot of money. It's a challenge. So you have infected birds going from place to place to place for recreational activities. Um, I don't, it might be a similar thing with athletes um, in our country. I don't know. <clears throat> and that was just webcast, wasn't it? <laughs> um, other routine practices, as was mentioned today, here in the grocery store we buy our food wrapped in cellophane and it's very clean. That's not the case over around the world. So here we see a typical little stall. This is in Vietnam. Somebody's got some ducks, some chickens. Uh, they've got a dead chicken over on the ground that's kind of partially plucked. 
There'll be dogs running around there, and they're taking a nap next to the cage. So we start to wonder, why, why are people getting infected with avian influenza from chickens? Gee, all you have to do is take a little look, and you see that millions and millions, billions of people are kind of in this situation routinely every day. So one in a million chance of jumping into a human, it's happening 50 times a day in Asia. Um, the movement in the pet trade, I don't think most people in this country really understand. We've done some work looking in markets, and you just go to a weekend market here, one in Bangkok, we counted 70,000 birds just on 25 weekends in half a year. 276 species of birds are in these markets. All those birds weren't from Thailand. About half the species of birds were brought in from other countries around the region, and they're mixed in these markets, dumped in the same cages. They all have their pathogens um, brought together, mixed between species, and that's when you see this either drift or mutation or, trans or reassortment of viruses, not just influenza, but other viruses too. And the trade is incredible, these routes. So if you start to track some where these wild animals are being moved from or wild birds, so they'll be brought in from the, from the wild with all their natural bacteria and viruses, mixed in a market so all the viruses start mixing and reassorting between species, and then they're moved again to another hub. So it's really kind of a scale-free network, almost like the Internet with these hubs. So you put, they suck into one hub, shipped again to another hub. We'll see turtles... Um, a lot of reptiles, snakes, turtles, uh, whole groups of birds, small mammals, large mammals, all flowing through, and they're going then to these major urban areas, these hubs in the wildlife trade, and there's hundreds of millions of animals being moved in the trade all the time. And then there's another, one other interesting cultural practice um, where then you go to the markets, buy these birds, and as a Buddhist practice, you get, it's good karma to release a wild animal back into the wild. So if you've gone to temple sites in Southeast Asia for a dollar or 50 cents, you can buy 10 wild birds and release them back into the wild. And the traditional custom, of course, is to kiss them before you release them. So you have birds from all these countries coming into these urban markets mixed with other species, being infected with a lot of things, sold, kissed, and released back into the wild in a country where they don't even belong. You see the potential for the mixing and the mixing of, of um, different viral strains and bacterial strains. So it's a complex problem, and it's going to require a lot of education and a lot of sincere effort. And once again, this is not going on in the U.S. It's going on overseas. So I keep saying we need to be looking upstream and focusing overseas and helping these developing countries deal with some of these practices market scene and related to SARS, when we started looking at animals flowing into Guangzhou with SARS, very similar with avian influenza. So animals were being shipped, that, that other map, thousands of kilometers from all different habitats around the world, and they're ending up in markets like in a room like this, and all those cages are stacked up, and there's no hygiene, and all those animals are sharing their viruses with people. And Animals are coming from thousands of miles away. We ship red-eared slider turtles from Florida to the Guangzhou market. So from the whole globe, animals are being shipped in and mixed in these markets, and there's hundreds of millions of animals a day. So it's a big source of infection, and we shouldn't be surprised when we have an outbreak of SARS. We shouldn't be surprised if avian influenza makes a leap um, between species because of this constant mixing if we can't get that under control. And the global trade is huge. So the, a lot of you are probably familiar more recently in the last month or two with um, bird, infected wild birds showing up in England um, and caught during quarantine in England. And those birds came reportedly, officially, uh, were shipped from Taiwan. But it didn't make any sense for those species of wild birds to be from Taiwan. They probably came from mainland China, went over to Taiwan to be mixed and legalized as a shipment to give proper documents to go to England, and they turned out to be H5N1 positive and, um, and turned up luckily in quarantine. Same for these mountain ho hawk eagles. They were smuggled into Belgium just to uh, carry on baggage. So two eagles were stuffed in plastic tubes or basket tubes, uh, put in somebody's carry-on bag, flew from Bangkok to Belgium, and they luckily picked it up at the airport. But we don't know how much of that's going on um, around the world. 
it's large scale because the wildlife trade, uh, at least the numbers, they say it's only second to the uh, illegal drug trade at a global scale. So large numbers of animals, um, and there's a lot of money invested. So it's a serious uh, risk factor for spreading disease. The wild bird part of it, and I'm so glad Dr. Torres started with this statement about cleaning up influenza and all wild birds, good luck. Um, I think that was a good point. It would be like removing all the <laughs> dust in the world. But there are some things we need to know, and there's some keys. So when we, what looks like what might have happened is wild birds getting reinfected with a new kind of high path strain of H5N1 this past year in China, and then spreading it up. And that's quite possible. Um, and got into wild birds and spread north again. And then possibly the Romania um, outbreak could be related to that. And the outbreak in Turkey this fall could be related to wild birds. Might be. I'm willing to admit that. It could have been also from the movement of poultry. Um, we don't really know. I do think I have a pointer. Um, but what we do know is every year um, there is kind of a north-south migration. And then there's some movements around here. It's very hard to pin down. Um, and the question always comes up, can you just show me the migration route? Um, and, and we don't know much about that because there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of species of migratory birds, and they don't all do the same thing. I don't know if you ever noticed Canada geese around Washington. Well, some of them are resident. Some of them migrate. Some of them move just a little further south. So even for any one species, you can't just say this is their migration route. There's a lot of variability within each species, and as we've seen, there's thousands of species of birds. Um, we tend to kind of lump them together in flyways, but in Asia, these flyways are, are not really well defined. In North America, flyways work really well um, because of our geography. The Mississippi River Valley provides a great place for um, birds to fly along because there's constant water supply, um, and birds need water, and the Mississippi River is really long, so it's perfect and the same with the coast. But when you get to Asia, there's no big north-south riverways. So these flyways don't really fit the pattern they do in the US. You can't go out to the Chesapeake Bay, the equivalent in Mongolia, and see millions of birds coming through. That doesn't happen. So we don't know much about how those birds are moving around, and we'd like to know more. And we don't know which species are going where. Um, but we do know that some of them, you know, potentially some wild birds, and in, certainly in North America, we know um, a lot of the migratory species have low path, you know, low path even influenza viruses. It tends to be more common in the north, and as the birds come south, we don't see them shedding virus anymore. And what happens in the breeding season um, up in the Arctic is you have this big mixing of birds, you have a lot of new baby birds that are susceptible, and you have virus that can survive winters probably frozen in the Arctic pool. So in that summer breeding, there's a kind of a reflourishing and a remixing and a reassortment with millions of birds exchanging different um, forms, strains of avian influenza virus, and kind of starting it again every, every spring and summer. But then they clear the infection normally, just like we do. They stop shedding the virus after a few weeks. Um, so as they migrate south, they tend, not to, they tend to be a little cleaner, and you'll pick up a little. But when you get down here, it's very rare in the southern part to pick up um, avian influenza virus or certainly shedding of virus. There's some, certainly some um, exceptions to that because we've seen outbreaks in the southern hemisphere in South Africa and, and even in the Falklands Islands, we've picked up some um, avian influenza strains down there. And there's a funny little place in southern, kind of funny little place down south. Um, <laughs> In Louisiana, Mississippi, where we see waterfowl, there's kind of another kind of a, um, a winter mixing, and we're not sure what that means. Some of the folks, uh, several people have been looking at that for years. But in general, we see it as a, a more common in the north, up here, and up here in the Arctic, and as the birds come south. So the question is, you know, will this disease go to Africa? Will it go, you know, come into America? And we haven't seen that before. That doesn't seem to get far, and especially if it's deadly in wild birds, as it's become, um, this H5N1 probably is not going to persist 
we don't think. What I'm concerned about is that they keep being reinfected if we don't get the disease in poultry under control. Um, adding to the confusion is, is a kind of a, a, a lack of standards. And it was interesting that we have the OIE, which is the World Animal Health Organization, who sets the standards for um, animal health in the livestock field. So they set the diagnostic standards, they set um, um, standards for shipping, and set standards for reporting. And those are excellent because a lot of work has gone into that. Um, but suddenly they've gotten involved because of avian influenza feeling they need to be working with wild birds too. So there was an expedition to Russia to help the Russians figure out what was going on with wild birds. Um, and this is the report that came out and we've kind of suddenly forgotten about um, standardization. So in this report, you have all these lists, and you can't really list them, see this, but they use common names of birds in this report instead of scientific names. As you can see here, so we have white-headed plover, laughing gull, oyster catcher, starling, wild duck, and there's a Russian common name, and it was translated into an English common name. So those of us in the wildlife health field kind of look at this list and kind of like, <laughs> I'm not even sure what this means. Um, because we got away, from, as soon as we got involved with wildlife here, we kind of got away from science. And that leaves us with a lot of questions. Because the laughing gull, which is a laughing gull here, that they tested, I think tested positive, um, that don't exist in Europe or Russia. Um, it's a Russian translation of an English translation of a Russian name that means laughing gull, um, but it's a completely different bird. Now, this has become the official standard um, report that says found in laughing, this virus is found in laughing gulls, but it's not found in laughing gulls because laughing, laughing gulls don't live over there. They live in the Western Hemisphere. So it was a, really a different gull they were talking about, and I'm sure they found it in a different gull, but we don't know what it is because we didn't use scientific names. So we've got to come up with some better standards if we're going to figure out all the birds that have been infected with this virus. We're going to start getting a handle on it. Um, what we did as a little experiment or a little trial run was um, during the outbreaks this past summer in China, we thought, well, let's look at some of the same bird species in Mongolia, because Mongolia is very easy to work with um, as a country, and, and take a look at what's going on there. So we went out and mounted kind of an expedition for a very low cost, and it was easy to put together, and said, let's go look at all these wild bird species that are reportedly dying of influenza in China and find out what's going on. So this is a picture of bar-headed geese, and you see a number of species, swans, geese, um, some black-headed gull species have been implicated. And we just went off and took off across Mongolia, uh, started down in the Gobi Desert and went up into the mountains, covered about 1,500 miles of territory, looking for wild birds and doing surveillance. And not just looking for dead birds, but really going out and looking for live birds, because dead birds are easy, you know, and they're dead. They're probably not migrating and spreading the disease. <clears throat> what we want to know is how is this disease moving around, so let's look at the live birds. And then it's interesting in our field that you have to kind of think backwards a lot um, to figure things out. So we went out and just collected fecal samples from wild birds and first you know, using spotting scope, get some good bird watchers, identify the birds, uh, let them stand around a while till they poop, and then walk over there, they fly away, you collect the feces, put it in viral cultural media, and we got that back actually to the United States working with the USDA laboratories, and they started looking for a virus. Um, as it turned out, we did run into a small die-off of birds while we were out there at all those different sites. So we were able to collect some samples right from dying birds. But we collected samples from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of live birds, and those all tested negative, even around the dying birds. So the prevalence in live birds was really low, um, and in, in fact, there weren't really that many birds dying. So we put together sheets like this, of not just the dead birds, because everybody can write about the dead birds, and if you look in all the journal literature, like Nature and Science, they report the dead birds, they don't report the live birds, um, which would be our suspects for carriers, and they don't report the N number, or the, oh, excuse me, the denominator, so we don't know 
really in the literature, everybody focuses on the dead bird and the virus because they study the disease. And as I said before, is we want to study the system. So we know what percentage of these birds are dying, what percentage of them are surviving, how, you know, what's the percentage in the whole population that have the virus, not just what percentage of the dead birds have the virus. So we make up a list using scientific names like this. This is all shared with everybody involved. Public, you know, put it uh, open source. We'll never get this published in Science or Nature because they refuse to publish anything that anybody knows about ahead of time. But we don't care about that. So we're not in that kind of an environment. We think it's important for the world to know. Um, and then link that, which is great with new technology. If you click right there on that spot, you can actually see the satellite image. This is uh, one of the lakes where an outbreak was. So there's some powerful tools that are available today to make this information easily available for lots of people. And actually, the outbreak was all around this lake, and there are people living here and over here. And we did, as I said, we did find some dead birds, and we did, you know, like good, good um, doctors, we collected some samples, and we did find in that... Um, that same pathology Dr. Torres was describing that was not limited to the, to the lung, to the intestines, um, but the lungs had a severe pneumonia, there was blood in the brain, the whole body of these birds um, was affected. And if you remember his slide where he talked about the, uh, showed a graph with the different isolates, and the top one said Mongolia, Swan 244, this is Swan 244. And this is the one that isolate came out of um, from that trip. And then we brought that back. That was given to USDA, who immediately sent it over to CDC. Um, they shared it with World Health Organization team. And that, vac that strain, that bird, that dead bird's virus, has been selected for the next human pandemic um, vaccine strain or vaccine production, which is really nice. It's not really why we went over there, but it shows what it can kind of yield from this kind of collaborative work. So we can pull, do this kind of investigation, try and learn about how this disease is moving around the world, um, what's being affected by it, and there's many, many payoffs um, from that, one of which can, it can actually pull out new virus, virus isolates uh, to lead to a vaccine. We think the really important thing that came out of this was it bridged the gap between these various sectors, and I'm hoping Dr. King will, will speak more on this a little later today. But for this investigation, we didn't just privately, um, you know, me and a friend or me and a colleague go sneak around over there and collect samples and bring it back once again to publish a paper. What we really did was we loaded up a team of people, and we got the National Academy of Sciences of Mongolia the Institute of Veterinary Medicine, the State Central Vet Lab, the Ministry of Health, and we took people from all those ministries or departments and made them come out in the field. Together, we rented two vans, loaded them all in the vans, and took off across the countryside. And these are people who never worked together before. It was really fascinating to see the dynamics start to change um, after three days of not bathing. Um, and being loaded into vans together, and you have the minister, the Department of Health, and the Department of Agriculture, and, there, and everybody's camping at night and cooking together, and that kind of the linkage with the international agencies too. So we had you know USDA and FAO, and everybody kind of involved. And by the end of this expedition, which I said costs almost no money um, because food is cheap in Mongolia, and um, in a few weeks, we'd collected incredible samples and, and, and brought them a new approach. And so I think the bigger product out of this whole project was getting Mongolians to think about working together and how productive they could be by sharing their knowledge with each other and their resources instead of fighting, which is the traditional thing between departments or ministries, fighting for resources. Um, what we're trying to do now with some help from some support in um, here in Washington is kind of expand this kind of concept for a global network of avian influenza surveillance. And it's really kind of beyond just avian influenza. Um, we could probably do use the same model really for all pathogens and use that kind of approach in Mongolia and, and expand it. And we've got some good examples, you know, from various other ways of collaborating to do this and talk about um, like Dr. Torrey showed, that kind of that network of laboratories in the U.S. Um, really build out that kind of network of laboratory capacity around the world. So up here we've kind of got 
diagnostic units and get out in the field and train more people. There's bird watchers, there's bird banding groups all over the world. And we can pick a, you know, 100, 200, 300 sites around the world where people are routinely looking at birds and banding birds and monitoring birds anyway, get them trained to collect samples, get that into a global system of labs, um, get those, um, all that work studied and, and genome sequenced, shared, open source, and all that available information then is made to the public health community, the agricultural health community, everybody has access. And the reason is the thinking on this is not about just H5N1, it's about all avian influenza viruses, it's about paramyxoviruses, it's about a whole set, and give that information of what's circulating around the planet and where ahead of time. So it's kind of like an early warning system, like we see with hurricanes. We pick them up when they're still in the eastern Atlantic. That's when we start looking at hurricanes, not the day they hit Florida. So we can be prepared. And we need that kind of same thing with wildlife and wildlife diseases. So there's an early warning system. So as there's vaccine planning for next year, they already know what kind of, what's out there circulating now, what's to be chosen from. So in discussions with CDC Influenza Branch, very excited about this concept of knowing what's out there ahead of time so they get a little time to start picking and choosing what they want to use for the future. And it's got to be a big partnership. No one agency is going to be able to do this. No one government. Um, the multilaterals are kind of bound by, you know, international diplomatic law. And um, so we kind of see there needs to be kind of a mix of government and multilaterals and NGOs. You know, it's easy for an NGO like ours to work in many countries. You know, I'm constantly in contact with countries we're not supposed to talk about here and finding out what's going on. Um, in those countries because they want help. People there, the scientists there want help. So there's a role for NGOs and there's a huge role for private industry because they have a big vested stake in, in this financially. And that's all about filling these intersectorial gaps and I think that'll come up later about um, a lot of these diseases we've mentioned today kind of fall between the cracks of traditional authority. So uh, who's in charge of monkeypox? Who's in charge of SARS? And, we'd, and we're not prepared, so I think it's about interagency collaboration, but also bringing in the private sector, both for-profit and non-profit. So we just took this concept to uh, China last week. I just got back from China. I thought, well, let's, let's you know, start small, go to China, and see if we can get all their agencies to work together. Um, and because, as I said somebody before, if it was easy, it'd already be done before. So we took on a nice challenge, went to China, and it was really fascinating to bring these different groups together um, in China and their, their Department of Public Health and their Department of Agriculture and their Department of the Environment, and they're some brilliant scientists and some great managers, um, but they've not really worked together very much. So it's not very different, you know, it's kind of, they're a few years probably behind us in the U.S. of really starting to, to build some collaborations, but they're certainly excited about it. It was interesting to see the, the agriculture department, because of the avian influenza outbreaks, had a lot of virus isolates. Um, so they had a lot of different strains of H5N1 um, that they'd have isolated over the last few years, but the public, they'd never been shared with the public health service. So the Public Health Service, I think, had maybe two isolates out of all the ones that the Agriculture Ministry, because they never really needed to work together or thought about working together, the Public Health Service hadn't really been able to develop very good diagnostic tests because they didn't have access to the material that the ag people had. And this came up in the meeting. It was just fascinating. They didn't even really realize it because they hadn't really discussed it amongst themselves. So just bringing people together has an incredible effect immediately. So we think that's when another way to start some of these intersectorial, filling some of these gaps. And we're trying to do that more. And it's once again, the kind of government, multilateral and private, um, nonprofit and profit groups working together um, to stimulate that. And this, that's this concept we have, which we call uh, One World, One Health. Um, because as Dr. Torres was saying, you know, when we talk about there used to be the, or there is the division of human health and livestock health and wildlife health, and it's obviously it's not solving the problems to break those groups apart. Uh, so we really got to kind of have this concept that there's only one health. Thank you.
we thought we'd do is take a few questions uh, now to give uh, an opportunity for you to follow up with, with things that have been raised in these first two presentations, then we'll have the next ones. So we have microphones, and I just ask that you let us know who you are before you pose your question. Who would like to kick us off? Uh, down here in the front, Charlotte. Right there. Hi, my name is Mary Dennigan. I'm with the Government Accountability Office. And thank you both for your very interesting uh, speeches. The question that I have is the idea of a uh, global network for avian influenza surveillance is, is quite interesting and obviously a challenge. Um, within our own networks here in the United States, we have the National Animal Health Laboratory Network. Um, CDC has their own network, the Laboratory Response Network. And there have been challenges just within our own country of trying to get these networks to talk to one another technical challenges, proprietary data challenges, and I guess the question I would have is, it sounds great, how realistic is this really? Yeah, it's, on. it's on, go ahead. It's on. Well, I think if, we've been thinking about this a long time. Um, so it's not a, it's, and that question comes up frequently. but. I think you have to let go. I think, you know, what's been done with the National Wildlife Health Laboratory has done some great work, you know, and it's part of the USGS, and they've been working for years of kind of shared database or database systems, I know. And I think part of the, the to be successful in what we found in the NGO world is you just have to get started. And um, don't wait till you design the most perfect program that's flawless and nothing will be left out. It would just, you just have to get going. Um, so I think there are established networks already of different organizations around the world that are ready to work together and share information. Um, I think the old uh, ProMed, ProMed's a great example of changing the dynamics over the years. When ProMed got started, nobody wanted to share information. Um, and now more and more people do. Not everybody does. A lot of people still won't share their information with ProMed until they get it published. But you can't worry about those people that aren't going to participate. So I think there's, it's, you get it going, and the, and the goal is over time there changes the mindset globally. So I think that's the only way forward. Um, so we've been talking in discussions here and then internationally with groups like um, Wetlands International that monitor sites all around the world. And they're based in Europe. Um, they have offices here, they have offices in South America, and you get them involved, and that's a private sector kind of group. Um, we have this a network of wildlife health experts who would love to contribute. Not all of them will, but we get going. And I think the trick is you don't let anybody, um, you can't let any one group dominate it. And I think the challenge in, with government in the U.S. is that typically the lead agency um, you know, there's something about a lead agency and then the partners, and the partners don't feel so equal. So you have to set up a mechanism where everybody's kind of at the, at the same level. Nobody can take over or control everything. Okay. Well, just some of the kind of ideas. The gentleman in the white shirt. Uh, Will Amatruda, Catholic University. My question is for William Karish. Uh, you drew the contrast in describing wild bird migrations between North America, where you have the Mississippi uh, Valley, and Asia, uh, where you said there are no great north-south rivers. But what about the three great south-north uh, south rivers in Siberia? Have, have, these been, uh, have, uh, have these been studied with regard to uh, the spread of avian flu or, or any other wildlife uh, disease for that matter? Well, they certainly don't fit with the spread of H5N1 this fall, which actually kind of went from southern China and headed north and west and went up through Kazakhstan and into Russia. So that wasn't a river system, though that is a, come a trade route that goes through that way. Um, the, some of the Russian literature, you know, some of the old pre-independent, so the USSR Russian literature, there's some good work that's been done on some migration, but there's huge gaps in it. So this, the question about bar-headed geese, a lot of the, if you look at the mapping data, um, what you'll see is the summer, summer breeding ground in the north, and then the winter, the wintering areas, and then somebody just drew a line between those two areas and said, that's where they go. Um, and what we've as we've looked at that more closely, 
it's kind of like with um, PowerPoint, you can flip the curve of your arrow, right flip it, mirror flip it the other way. Um, and they've just kind of arbitrarily connected with arrows summer and, and winter breeding areas, and they don't really know how they get there. So if you flip the arrow one way, all the birds flew through Bangladesh. If you flip it the other way, they all fly through Thailand. And to the Thais and the Bangladeshis, that's really important to know which way, you know, if they really go. And so there's so much, there's such a gap in that information. Gentlemen. Some good information, a lot of missing information. Uh, now, uh, Nelly, the gentleman in the red shirt in the back, and then we'll come down. If you could hold your hand up there, yes, thanks. Hi, uh, Steve Osofsky, also from the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, given that we're sitting in Washington, um, and I'm hoping this will come up later on in the sessions, Obviously, in the, uh, maybe by the end of December, Congress is going to pass uh, legislation related to avian influenza and pandemic possibilities. Right now, the, uh, and this came off the Hill late last night, they're talking about maybe a $7.2 billion appropriation, of which perhaps $250 million or so would be designated for international work. Uh, we've already heard the, of the, the, the value added and the efficiency of working upstream overseas before a virus like H5N1 hits our shores, um, I think we need to, in the next few weeks, think very hard uh, as agencies and with Congress in looking at how we're investing to preclude a pandemic in terms of the fact that this is an animal disease. Um, the plan, as proposed, for example, has only $5 million allocated for uh, wild bird surveillance outside of the United States. I can assure you from the work we've been doing related to the GAO question, that will not be adequate to cover the type of program that Dr. Karish described. So I just wanted to, to flag these issues, and I'll, for those of you from USAID who are in the audience, um, we are very concerned about this, and we welcome the opportunity to dialogue. Um, the wildlife veterinary community uh, has not been able to participate in discussions with USAID, for example, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, we want to make this offer again to share this experience because we think, again, by bridging that gap between the human health community, the domestic animal health community, the wildlife community, that's the only way we're going to beat this. And we're, it's coming down to the wire, and I think Congress is going to make some decisions in the next few weeks that we're going to have to live with. And we really have an opportunity here, but it's, it's slipping by right now. So. Terrific. Thank you very much, Steve. Maybe what we'll do is we'll gather a couple of questions and, and give you a chance to answer it and then go to the next. So we had a lady right here on the side and then down in the front. Thank you. Good morning. Hi. Thank you. I'm uh, Amy Nucci. I'm a writer from Revolution Health News. And I have a question. Which of these scenarios do you think um, North Americans should be most concerned with, okay? Would it be um, buying a parakeet or, you know, some type of bird from a pet shop, uh, traveling abroad and ingesting chicken or other poultry that's not fully cooked, or uh, in terms of the migrating wildlife sitting out in a park and feeding the birds, things of that nature? Okay, so multiple choice, but let's hold, yes. let's, we'll, we'll hold, we'll hold the quiz for one moment here. Uh, Charlotte, could, the lady in the red here, uh, we'll just, we'll gather a couple of them and then okay. get them all in. Thank you. Uh, Julia Albright from George Washington University Medical Center. Uh, yesterday we had a working group with a French ambassador. The most recently, uh, the science paper, which uh, the published by Chinese uh, multiple institutes, and uh, they show very good data on pathology, pathological of a waterfall. And uh, plus today, I saw some of your pa pathological studies. And as I was reporting that finish, some uh, physician asked me, what well, these are the waterfalls, what about in human pathology? So I'm just asking you, uh, when you look at some, I presume you did look at some autopsies for the human humans recently, uh, you know, Vietnam or these cases, are they pretty com comparable with uh, animals data? In another word, in the brain, uh, have you looked at the brain tissue? Do you see glioocytes? Do you see a hemorrhagic and et cetera, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So in the near future, I can answer some of those. Okay, ma'am, if you could just pass that down the row. Uh, uh, well, uh, actually, Nelia, could you give it to, yeah, there you go. Thank you very much. Joe Dudley? Uh, Joe Dudley with EAI Corporation. A uh, question for Dr. Torres. 
you stated categorically that there has been no human-to-human -human transmission of the H5N1 in Asia. Now, uh, the Thais have published uh, a case of probable human-to-human -human transmission. There have been reports as yet unpublished scientifically of, of at least one cluster of human-to-human -human transition transmission in Vietnam. WHO now says that there have been no sustained human-to-human -human transmission in, uh, in this episodic. Uh, could you clarify that for us, please? Okay, now Joe, could you hand it to the lady in the blue, and that'll be our final question, uh, and then give our panelists a chance to respond. Thank you. I'm Mary Agnes Carey of Congressional Quarterly. Uh, the specter of the close contact in other countries with humans and animals was raised and the transport issues, and we've got to get control of that. I wondered if you could elaborate on how you would go about trying to change those cultural practices. Terrific. Thank you. Gentlemen? Let, let me tackle some of them here. The, the question about the risks, uh, pet birds uh, travel, uh, uh, consuming chicken, migratory birds. Uh, I think that we need to keep in mind is that uh, we do not have that strain here in North America or in, in our world. And, and as I mentioned before, we need to have everything, the, the agent, the host, uh, to have the disease. We, we just touching birds by themselves or traveling to other countries is, is not going to be a risky uh, situation unless you go and perhaps uh, be in very close contact with very sick birds. Now, let's keep in mind that we have had, as Dr. Carlson mentioned, millions of people in contact with millions of infected birds, and yet the number of uh, people seriously ill and died is relatively low. So what I understand from people who have done some uh, epidemiological studies is we still don't know how many get infected. There, there's not a lot of serology done in humans to see if they get exposed to this. So I think that even with the current situation, uh, it will be for us here in the United States, very, very, very uh, low risk and negligible risk of, of being in contact or, or traveling to areas that are affected. Most people will travel. They're not going to sleep next to the birds. Uh, so, so simple precautions are going to be fine. Uh, the, the, the question about what I said about human to human, indeed, uh, there's a cluster in Thailand that was reported. Now, what I understand is that there's been a lot of questions about it whether or not that indeed was the case because the epidemiology is not very clear. So at least, yes, we had the possibility of, but it has not been a sustained transmission human to human. That is the, 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 the portion that is missing. So. By the pathology? The pathology, um, I, well, and I'm not a pathologist, so let me start by saying that, but at least what looks like in the literature, the the pulmonary edema, the severe lung changes, uh, changes in brain tissue um, look the same. And I think it links to what D Dr. Torres was showing, the cleavage sites uh, s suddenly change in the high path form, and it's the same for animals, so the virus can, it can grow really well in other tissues besides intestinal tract, and the same for humans that we're seeing in wild birds and in, in, in other animals. Uh, the cultural practices and traditions. Um, those are slow to change, but they do change. And, you know, nothing is fixed in time. If you look at traditions in this country right now, they are different than they were 100 years ago. So the, we're talking about shifting over time. None of this is going to change by next week. Um, and, and certainly if there's not serious funding um, put into this about helping developing countries and third world countries to make that change, it will never change. But even at so, you have to, there has to be a patience level. So our work in Africa with Ebola and working with villagers, it's about education. And, you know, the next day they'll still go out and do the same thing. But after repeated treatment, um, working with people, you can change things. Cigarette smoking in this country um, has changed over the last 20 years. So a lot of things, we're talking about public health, we're talking about education. You have to, you have to start somewhere and then and move, move forward from there. Um, Vietnam now has banned the drinking of raw duck blood. You know, that, that's going to help. That's going to reduce viral contamination of people from sick ducks. Um, but it's not going to be complete. But after, you know, by, as these young Vietnamese get a little older, they probably just might even lose their taste for it. So you have to see some things. The media can have a big impact. There's been great media campaigns on the wildlife trade. Um, 
and playing that down in Asia. So there's some things we can do. I think it's a moving forward and reducing risk. It's all about reducing the numbers of contacts. It's not about a, a zero risk. We can't get that way. Terrific. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I'll invite Buzz to come up and, and get us started on the, the second uh, uh, second session, Buzz Klopp from Townsend, Inc. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's uh, certainly a uh, distinct pleasure to be here today. and. Uh, I'm going to attempt to uh, maybe give you a perspective that uh, you might not be that familiar with in terms of uh, that of a, of a poultry industry veterinarian on avian influenza. Uh, the, there's a tendency to talk about the poultry industry, and it's not a poultry industry. It's three poultry industries. They're very distinct entities, and uh, they do have two things in common. Uh, essentially, all the birds raised in all three industries have white feathers. And all three industries produce food, high quality food. And if we, if we look at the scope of these industries in terms of uh, uh, their economic impact, um, the export of poultry products, including eggs, turkey meat, and chicken meat, really exceed $2 billion a year. It's uh, certainly a significant economic entity. And when we look at the domestic situ scene, uh, our industries are also very significant, uh, being in excess of $20 billion a year and employing uh, tens of thousands of people throughout the uh, United States. But I think another way, and maybe even more important way, to look at our domestic industry is in terms of food. Uh, you know, they always say that people make the world go around. Well, people can't make the world go around without food. Food gives us the energy, it gives us the sustenance to, to, to do our work and do our endeavors. Uh, each year, the average person consumes 253 eggs. We consume 16 pounds of turkey. I swear to God, I ate more than that last Thursday, but, uh, <laughs> you know. And we eat 87 pounds of chicken. And uh, this, this gives us the ability to, to do a lot of what we do. Now, I'm going to take a few minutes on this slide and uh, try to keep it in mind as, uh, as I proceed further on the uh, size and diversity of the three poultry industries. In red is the brawler industry, and uh, this is the meat industry of the United States. We produce, it says there, 8 billion, 740 million. It's actually closer to 9 billion by the time you uh, take into account breeders and primary breeders. Uh, and you can see the, the corridor of production, not going really Delaware and Maryland, the mid-Atlantic area, coming down the eastern seaboard. What you may find surprising, and the cattle people of Texas may find this surprising, is that the state of Texas is now one of the top ten producing brawler chicken company, states in the United States. Uh, and another typically uh, beef cattle area that has grown significantly in brawler chicken production is the state of Missouri. If we look at turkeys, the distribution of turkeys tends to follow a line within the Midwest. And yes, the Mississippi River runs right down here too. Uh, another fact that uh, you might find interesting is the large turkey industry in the state of California. And as a nation, we produce just under 300 million turkeys a year. Uh, we look at the table egg industry, and these are the eggs that we eat for uh, generally for breakfast or egg salad or whatever it may be. And there's a kind of a line more through the Midwest. And what I find interest, what I found very interesting as I put this map together is the state of Florida is one of the largest egg producing states in the United States. We've also gone into a, to the, uh, the heart of the Midlands with uh, the state of Nebraska now being a significant entity in the production of table eggs. And I want to emphasize again, not just the economic value of our industries, but the food value of our industries. Now sort of the scope and, and how the industries work on issues, uh, we really do have a wonderful communication network. It isn't perfect. Uh, like anything else, but uh, we have our trade associations, the uh, National Chicken Council, National Turkey Federation, 
United Egg Producers, which are obviously distinct entities to those uh, particular industries, the United States Poultry and Egg Association, which overlaps with all three of those groups, and then countless state associations. And the ability to communicate on strategic issues, be they disease, be they marketing issues from around the nation within a matter of hours, it, it's there. Again, it's not perfect, but we do have a, a very good communication network. Now, poultry veterinary medicine, of which I'm very proud to be a part of, we have a number of professional groups, our parent organization, the American Veterinary Medical Association. And then one of the subgroups of that is the American Association of Avian Pathologists, what we call AAAP. This is a 60-year-old organization that has worked extensively in the area of disease research, both basic research, applied research, that has led to the uh, uh, actual eradication of some diseases, to successful methods of disease control, which have improved the health of our poultry industry significantly over the past 60 years. The American College of Poultry Veterinarians is a relatively new group. This was put together uh, uh, about 10, 15 years ago for those of us who specialize in the area of poultry medicine. I can assure you going through veterinary school that there are significant differences between chickens and dogs. And the ability to, to learn, and it is, it's a constant learning process on husbandry and disease of poultry. Now, within the industry, we also have specialty groups, the Association of Veterinarians in Brawler Production, of which I'm a member. There's an Association of Veterinarians in Turkey Production. There's an Association of Veterinarians in Table Egg Production. And the communication, the exchange of information, especially on infectious and contagious diseases, occurs on an hourly basis, a daily basis, 365 days a year. Again, it's not a, it's not a perfect one, but we, we have ready, uh, readily available dialogue. In addition to this, there is extensive interaction between industry, state, and federal, and federal officials. This is done a, a, to a large degree through the United States Animal Health Association. Within that organization, there's a specific committee on transmissible diseases of poultry. And I can assure you that the subject of avian influenza has been of significant part of discussions in those rooms for the last 23 years. There's a National Poultry Improvement Plan, better known as NPIP. NPIP is a division of USDA and within APHIS. And I'll talk a little bit more about NPIP, but it has a long history on disease control programs in the United States. Our national, regional, local meetings, and the laboratories that go, that go with uh, the United States are, are of tremendous value in terms of the uh, diagnosis and control of diseases, again, not the least of which is avian influenza because Avian influenza is, is, is no stranger to us. Now, the USDA accredited veterinarian, of, of which I am one, uh, in, in this capacity, we are granted certain uh, rights and privileges by USDA in terms of health certification, in terms of uh, dealing with interstate and, and even international uh, trade. And with that right goes a responsibility to act in the, the manner in which we've been educated, trained, and have learned how to do. Now, disease control. You know, when we talk about disease control, there's a tendency to think of this as a negative. And, uh, but it's not. Actually, a, a better way to look at this is in terms of poultry health. Poultry health is something that we, we pride ourselves in, and it's, it's not easy. And there's a number of factors, and I'm going to kind of uh, hit on this a little bit as we go through it, from vertical integration to biosecurity standards to disease prevention and monitoring and the emergence of emergency poultry disease plans. And I want to emphasize this part right here for quick response because surveillance is one thing, but what you do with the information that comes out of surveillance is a whole other situation. And the need for a quick response cannot be uh, underestimated. I want to give you a, a little bit of an overview of, of vertical integration. And it's important to remember that this occurs in the countryside. 
all over the United States, so there's, there is definitely intertwining. But there is a, a very good disease biosecurity uh, concept within vertical integration. We start right here with the breeder flocks. We buy, we go outside the integration circle here to the primary breeder, we buy day old chicks that are raised in, in pullet and then into the hen houses. These hens then produce fertile eggs that go to our hatcheries. These are not just hatcheries that you can walk into and buy eggs, or this is not a hatchery you can walk into and sell us eggs. We won't buy them. In fact, we won't even let you in the door. The only eggs that go into our hatchery are eggs that come out of these flocks uh, because we know the history, we know the disease programs of these eggs. The hatchery takes 21 days in the case of uh, chickens, and we've got a day-old chick that goes in onto the brawler farm, and when they're raised as young chickens, all of this occurring within the vertical integration chain where we have control over the management and disease control programs for these chickens. We have our own feed mill. These, these are designated feed mills. We don't produce cattle feed in these feed mills. We don't produce hog feed in these feed mills. We won't sell you feed out of these feed mills. These mills are there to produce feed for our chickens. The feed is delivered in our trucks. And the chickens then, as they grow, then go on to a processing plant and come out the back door as food for the customers. And I want to give you just a few little uh, individual shots to show you that this, this scenario really does exist. This is a, a, an egg tray in a, in a uh, what we call a setter. And these are, these are hatching eggs. This number right here, 6036, is a unique number. That tells me what breeder flock produced those eggs. No other flock produced those eggs. The 10-5 was October the 5th, which is uh, the date that those eggs were picked up on the farm. This goes on every day, every week, throughout the year, where we can track eggs, and as they become baby chicks, the same identity flows into what we call the hatcher trays and the hatchers. And as we go into the hatchery, where we vaccinate uh, chicken, chicks against diseases that is necessary to vaccinate them for, we maintain this identity within this chick box. These boxes are then loaded on designated, what we call chick buses. And that kind of looks like a bus, doesn't it? <laughs> and these buses carry the baby chicks to the farm. And again, we won't, uh, the only chicks that go on these buses are our chicks. This is, this is a means, a fundamental means of biosecurity because the, the, the right to grow animals is a privilege. And with the privilege of growing animals goes the responsibility to do it in a manner that is conducive to the well-being of the animal. And if I can leave you with a thought that I'm going to dwell on as we go a little bit further, is that the practices that have evolved in, in our production system, they didn't just happen. They have evolved over decades of basic research, applied research, the, what we all call the school of hard knocks. We've tried some things that didn't work, and we've tried a lot of things that have worked, and we continue to do this. If you walked in a chicken house today and compared it to the chicken house of the 1970s, there's virtually no comparison, virtually no comparison. So with all of this, uh, you can, oops, got a little bit ahead of myself here. This is a, a, a fairly typical chicken farm. The, you know, it's the uh, chicken house, within, within uh, the chicken house are the birds. They have water lines. They have feeder lines. We produce the feed. The water comes from either well water or in the case of counties where uh, municipal water systems are expanding, they're actually on a municipal water system. And we have biosecurity programs in place. Are they perfect? No. But we do have procedures and policies on who comes on these farms, who goes in these houses. We also discourage the, the construction of houses close to ponds that will attract migratory waterfowl. We don't want, we not only discourage, we virtually demand that our producers do not raise backyard types of poultry because the concepts of poultry management and disease control depend on this. At the end of the grow out period, we load the chickens on our trucks. This is all our equipment right here. These are the cages. Here they go right back here on, onto a tractor trailer where they'll go on to a processing plant. The only chickens that come on these lots are our chickens. 
These are the same trailers that I just showed you. They'll go in the back door and come out, or they'll go in the front door and come out the back door as food. And um, I, I hope that uh, if you didn't have an understanding of vertical integration, you can see the, the value of this from a uh, disease control standpoint. Now, disease prevention and monitoring. Uh, surveillance has been a long-standing friend of the poultry industry. We got very concerned back in the early 70s because of the exotic Newcastle outbreak in Southern California. We started developing emergency disease plans. Emergency, uh, we started developing surveillance plans for diseases and then in 1983, when the H5 high path influenza hit Pennsylvania, we became very concerned about avian influenza. And uh, we, we are very fortunate that we have a good network, as Dr. Therese has mentioned, of diagnostic laboratories. There is routine submission of sick and even healthy flocks in the diagnostic laboratories for routine workups to, t to determine uh, what infections are, are actually present within our flocks. I keep hitting the wrong button. The, uh, the interaction of the industry with both USDA APHIS and, and APHIS NPIP in the development of monitoring plans of which NPIP has an avian influenza monitoring plan that's been in effect for a number of years. And one of the concepts that's, that's really evolved as we've had to deal with these emergency disease situations is what we call ramp up capabilities. Our diagnostic laboratories operate five days a week eight or nine hours a day. But if we get in, and when we have gotten into situations with disease outbreaks, these laboratories ramp up. They operate seven days a week. They may operate 10, 12, 16 hours a day. In terms of the load, the diagnostic load that has to be handled to determine the, the extent of an outbreak and means for us to work our way out of it. New technologies, I cannot tell you enough about our industry and our need and our acceptance of new technologies, not just in avian influenza, but in everything. One of the most significant uh, new technologies to come to us on avian influenza was the development by USDA ARS in, in Athens Laboratory of the RT-PCR for avian influenza. What did this do? Well, this detects antigen. And it used to be, in Pen when we had the outbreak in Pennsylvania in the 80s, it took us about two weeks to identify the virus. With the RT-PCR, you can do that in two hours. What does that, that one of the other technologies that was used in Pennsylvania in the 80s was the, the agar gel precipitin test to, to, to detect, right, to pick up antibody. It's, that test is still used. That, that test takes two days. We now have uh, the ELISA capability which instead of two days, it does it in two hours. And in fact, we can have data electronically transmitted from a laboratory on the East Coast to the West Coast within two hours. I don't want to say that this is perfect, but the, the abilities and the infrastructure of, of our uh, disease handling uh, system is really very, very significant. Excuse me. Uh, disease prevention and monitoring. Dr. Torres, touched on the OIE terminology, and it's, it now focuses on notifiable avian influenza. There's a very heavy focus on H5 and H7, and well, there should be a heavy focus on H5 and H7. H7, we've known about since the 1930s with the, uh, what we used to call foul play. Uh, H5 uh, taught us who it is in the 80s in Pennsylvania. And we now have very healthy respect for both of these uh, particular H influenzas. And the ability to diagnose, control, protect our food supply, and to protect the confidence of the consuming American public that the food supply that they eat is indeed quality and, and safe. And uh, there's a, a – ah, I keep hitting the wrong button. There's a uh, – concept, and Dr. Torres touched on this also, of compartmentalization. This is a, this is a very real uh, concept. And at one time, there would be penalties on domestic uh, export of poultry meat if an occurrence of avian influenza happened in wild birds or if it occurred in non-commercial type poultry. 
even though the commercial poultry industry would be free. There was times, in fact, that an influenza would occur in Pennsylvania and there would be an embargo nationwide on export of poultry meat. Well, through compartmentalization, and not just a word, because compartmentalization must be real. This isn't me standing up here and telling you that Townsend chickens don't have avian influenza. It, it doesn't work that way. We use the infrastructure of the diagnostic network and the testing and the validation to determine that, yes, the commercial bird compartment is free of avian influenza where there may be a backyard poultry flock that is affected with avian influenza or as the wild birds, we're not going to do anything about the wild birds. They've got influenza. But what we can do about wild birds, and I'm going to touch on this some more, is we can keep their access from our commercial poultry. The geographic areas, like I say, at one time, an occurrence of AI in one state would result in a nationwide embargo. The understanding of this disease has, has led to the concept of, of compartmentalization. And all of this, uh, if we think we know influenza, we're, we're kidding ourselves. Uh, if there's one thing I've learned about this is that you, you treat this disease with humility and respect because you, you don't know what it's going to do. And in that regards, one of the things that we have focused on, and this has uh, come about a lot through the emerging technologies, is early detection. But early detection without quick and aggressive action doesn't really do anything. We've wasted all the infrastructure that goes into early detection. The way I discuss it with, with our folks is that if we have and we have not, uh, knock on wood, uh, an outbreak of H5, we don't want to talk today about what are we going to do next week. We want to talk today, are we going to start depopulation at 5 o'clock tomorrow morning or 6 o'clock tomorrow? And I can assure you those discussions are very real, they've happened, and, uh, and they work. The infrastructure, it must be continuously improved. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything that stays the same is slipping behind. And Mother Nature, I always liked the, the commercial years ago about uh, Mother Nature being fooled by the margarine, and uh, she soon let people know that she did not like to be fooled. And Mother Nature is, is in control of all of this, but we have certain things that we can do that can minimize the risk of even influenza in our commercial poultry. No one's mentioned this yet today, but it, it has to be the potential for intentional introduction. And we have a, a ready communication network, uh, and, and we do the best we can with this one. But to be honest with you, this, this is the one we have to be on guard with. A little food for thought here. Uh, the world is getting smaller. This has been touched on also. I can remember in trips to Europe, we used to talk about going to Europe for a week or two because it was such a long trip. Now you go for the day. And this, this is not going to stop. It can't stop, in fact. This is the world. But what can stop is what do we do when we go there? Or what do we do when we come back? Because, again, the, the rights and privileges that we all have in this world come with responsibility. Now, this is an intriguing uh, little slide to me, and you may wonder what in the world this is all about. But uh, uh, the slide on the picture on the right is a group of children from the uh, youth group of St. Peter's Episcopal Church in Lewis, Delaware, which is where my wife and I go. Well, this group visited in 2004 Heifer International. And this young lady right there, stood in front of our congregation and gave a report on their experiences at Heifer International. And I listened to it and I thought, this is wonderful. And it really was. It was wonderful. They talked about what they learned about feeding animals and taking care of animals and, and all of this. And we as a congregation had given them some money to uh, donate to the uh, agricultural practice that they liked the most. And what did they pick? but the open air lagoon system for raising the poultry and animals that's used in many areas, you've seen other slides of this, in the third world. That's exactly right. I mean, I about bit my tongue in half. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we uh, after the service, I went up to our, to our minister and I said, Mark, I said, do you have any idea what we, uh, uh, what these kids are supporting and the role of this very system in the ecology of avian influenza virus. Well, he didn't. 
I explained it to him. And a series of emails went through St. Peter's, up to Heifer International, and back to my office, and much to the credit of Heifer International, they withdrew their support of this program. And, you know, it, it's the type of thing that shows you the value of dialogue and, again, the fact that with all the rights that we enjoy come, or the privileges that we enjoy, come responsibility. You've seen a lot of maps. This one is a little closer to home, and maybe if I had this one to do over again, I might have focused maybe the top ten poultry states. But uh, live bird movements in the United States do occur. It occurs, and my, my father always told me, he said, only talk about things that you know, so this is what I have these arrows on here for. And I want to talk about the live bird market system. I want to talk a little bit about auctions. I want to talk a little bit about flea markets. And the live bird market system, and you need to understand that this is a system. There are production farms, and there's a very extensive live bird market system in the Northeast. State of Pennsylvania produces about 80% of the birds that go into the live bird markets of New York, New Jersey, and their own state of Pennsylvania. Uh, in interestingly enough, the live bird markets of New York, uh, on a yearly basis, sell about 26 million birds. That's not chickens, that's not turkeys, that's not pheasants, that's not chuckers, that's not quail. That's all of those things, including ducks and geese and rabbits goats, all of this stuff is commingled. Uh, USDA, much to its credit, about three years ago, formalized an H5, H7 live bird market system control program. And this, this system has advanced tremendously. And one reason it advanced so tremendously was the occurrence of an H7N2 AI in Delaware and Maryland in 2004 because that was, in fact, a live bird market strain. So now, these arrows here represent what I know to occur. One from a farm in very southwest corner of Missouri, almost in the state of Arkansas, live birds hauled all the way across up here to New York City. Now, one thing that's happened as a consequence of this now is that the state of Missouri is now a participant in this USDA H5, H7 live bird market program. Prior to this, they weren't. One of the requirements of participation in this system is one, health certificates on birds before they leave the farm, and number two is when a truck goes into the markets, it does not come back to the farm. Sounds basic enough, doesn't it? Well, that, guess what? It was going on that way. And trucks, if they're going to, and, and the trucks are reused. So as they come back, they have to go through an extensive sanitation program before they can, before they can be reused to, to uh, lo load birds. This was not going on before. We also have birds out of South Central Iowa going all the way from Iowa to New York City into the live bird markets. From Central North Carolina, we've had birds going up to New York. Now there's a live bird market system in the state of Florida. 21 of the 50 uh, states are now participants in this H5, H7 USDA live bird market program. I sincerely hope that virtually every poultry state in the United States will become a participant in this program. I don't have auctions and flea markets here, but you can literally draw on our arrow from here to here and from here to here because there is bird movement that goes on within the United States. And I'm not saying by, I'm not even, I don't even want to imply that this shouldn't happen. But again, it goes with the responsibility of raising animals. It isn't that hard to get health certification. It isn't that hard to follow some very basic fundamental procedures in animal care. Uh, some more food for thought. In this new millennium, we, we really like alternative poultry production practices. The free range bird has hit the menu of all the good restaurants, maybe all the ones that aren't so good. But uh, what is the free range bird? You've seen some slides of free range birds. And there's a, there's a mental concept that this is a clean, natural type of bird. Well, I don't think I have to tell you that it, it, it's, it's not natural and it's not clean. If we look at the, the most recent sources of avian influenza outbreaks in the United States, we can go back to free range birds, to the live bird market system. 
to the mixed population rearing practices that are emerging. And, and it's not my intention to, to stop these folks. And as, and as uh, we, we get more new citizens coming into this country, the way I view this is we need to raise their production standards for animals. We do not need to lower our standards to that. Because I want to tell you, the, 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 there was a very extensive school of hard knocks in learning some of the things that we did. Another aspect of uh, food for thought is the USDA National Organic Plan. This requires, I want to say that again, the USDA or National Organic Plan requires outdoor access of poultry. And to say that uh, that has upset me is, is, is fairly mild. Uh, we actually produced some certified organic chickens in one of our operations. At the recent U.S. Animal Health uh, Association meeting, Transmissible Diseases of Poultry, we passed a resolution in that group to urge USDA to withdraw this requirement. Haven't seen the results of this yet. But I want to emphasize again that free range co-mingling of, of domestic poultry with wild migratory waterfowl, and this is a real picture. This is not something that was staged. Uh, it, it goes on, and it's, it's really poultry husbandry 101. Uh, and Dr. Koresh is, has, has talked more on this than, than, than I could even understand. But one part is this is not controllable. You know, these are nature's animals. They're going to go where they go. But what is controllable is the access of these birds to domestic poultry. It does not have to happen. Uh, these are some pictures of the actual live bird markets. And you need to understand that there's three chickens here, and this one may have come from Missouri, this one may have come from Iowa, and this one may have come from North Carolina. If you look here on this floor, you see all sorts of things going on here. And there are turkeys in there, there are ducks in there, there are chuckers in there. And the, the average uh, span of life for birds in these markets is only three or four days. Uh, but the, and the markets themselves have done a tr tremendously wonderful job of cleaning themselves up. It's to their advantage to clean themselves up. It's also to our advantage and to your advantage for them to clean themselves up. But we, we need to be mindful of the commingling that goes on within these establishments. Live bird auctions, they're all over the country. These birds move, and again, they're, they're a garden variety of birds, and the, the co-mingling that can go on here, I don't think they kiss these birds before they send them out, but they do leave here, and they go, probably not where they came from, but someplace else. If, if I could leave you with a thought, it's to really to, to, I hope you can maybe understand a little bit better and hopefully recognize the value of the modern poultry food production system. This is, uh, it, it, it really is a resource to this country. And, uh, and again, I'm gonna say that the, the ability to grow animals is a privilege. And with that privilege comes a responsibility to do things in the right fashion. And uh, we all like to eat, and I'm gonna close it the way I started is that the consumption of food is what gives us the energy and the sustenance to do all the things that we do in our daily lives. And with that, I thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Klopp. And now we are going to have Dr. Osterholm come into the podium. And as we did before, then we'll have uh, opportunity for questions at the end of this uh, sequence here. Thank you, Dr. Torres. Um, also, I want to thank the, the uh, organizers of the meeting for inviting me back again after my previous presentation in September. Uh, and with that, I'd like to start out actually with an update. I left my presentation in September here with the idea that if a pandemic hadn't occurred in the next several weeks to month, that there would start to be blowback on this issue, that people would say, wait a minute, you're scaring us needlessly. So what I've cataloged, cataloged for you here are the quotes that I've actually been able to discern either from the media, in the media, or from personal meetings that I've been attended in the last month. First of all, understanding pandemic influence. It's a bunch of scaremongers who were wrong before, SARS, Ebola, et cetera. That the sense is that, you know, wait a minute, this all didn't take over the world. Why is this different? Without an understanding that 
what the media may have said about these and what the public health community says about these in terms of international implications are very different. Y2K swine flu in Iraq, you know, they're all in the same thing. Again, uh, these are all mistakes you were wrong. Well, I, um, I was actually rightly chastised by some technology people that said Y2K may have been a lot worse had we not actually done the kind of preparation that we did, so don't dismiss that as having been wrong. Second of all, swine flu, I would be here to tell you today that I personally at the time, and not that I was so wise then, actually did not agree with the actions that we undertook in 1976 based on not being prepared, but the fact that we made a decision to vaccinate a country well before we had to make that decision, but some people decided they wanted to make that. In Iraq, none of us can talk about that with any knowledge of what the future might hold. It can't happen. I'll share with you today, it does happen. It has happened. Nothing we can do about it, which I think you've also heard today that's not true. And I believe I'm here to talk about the human side of the issue. There's much we can do. Unfortunately, we haven't done much. In this community where there has been great importance put on pandemic influenza, at least from a rhetorical, political sense in the last several months, we still have a bill sitting up in Congress with appropriations that's not seen fit to have been approved yet. So the urgency uh, sometimes doesn't match up with the actual rhetoric that has been used. Finally, the public can't handle this, and I think we've all learned a long time ago that the public handles the truth if the truth is spoken. And the point of the matter is, is that how do we put that out there so that they can discern what the truth might be about the issue. So that's my update, but this is what I've heard, and uh, unfortunately I think that the predictions for this will only accumulate over the next months if in fact there isn't, quote unquote, the pandemic, the thing that none of us want to see happen. Well, I would remind you, though, where others may put this into perspective. This was a quote from a recent presentation that Senator Bill Frist gave, Dr. Bill Frist, at Princeton uh, a week and a half ago, in which he said, think of a fast-moving, highly contagious disease that wipes out 5% of the world population, i.e. 50 million people. Half a million of them in the U.S. Bodies pile up in the streets. There aren't enough morticians to bury the dead, nor are there enough doctors and nurses to tend to the sick. The church is closed. The school is shut. Telecommunications and transportations grind to a halt. The public succumbs to hysteria and panic. Police protection fails, order decays, productivity dives. Sounds like a scene from a science fiction film, doesn't it? But what if I told you it already happened? What if I told you that was the pandemic flu that swept across America and around the globe in 1918? Or if I told you that this glimpse into the past might be a preview to our future? An avian, avian flu pandemic is no longer a question of if, but a question of when. You can decide the source of that and how you put stead in that. This one probably is more meaningful as from the science world, clearly. The World Health Organization formal document from September of 2005, the present situation is markedly different for several reasons. First, the world has been warned in advance. For more than a year, conditions favoring another pandemic have been unfolding in parts of Asia. Warnings that another pandemic may be imminent have come from both changes in the epidemiology of human and animal disease and an expanding geographical presence of the virus, creating further opportunities for human exposure. I would use this statement, I think, as a fairly definitive and clear-cut statement about what we're talking about today. Now, you've seen a lot about the world change. I showed this slide in a previous presentation. I want to bring it back again because I think this is the overall framework of which we must understand the world we live in today. The slide shows days of circ to circumnavigate the globe in the last 150 years while uh, 150 years ago it took a year to get around the globe and we improved that dramatically in that next 100 years, what isn't depicted in this slide is what goes around the world now. Last year our best guesstimate is about between 1.2 and 1.4 billion people crossed an international border in an airplane. Now in many instances that may have been the same person doing it more than once. But in addition to that, it's the goods. And you've heard this morning on the animal world, the animal world clearly is an important part of what goes around the world. In addition, if you look at the world population of humans, and it has implications for animals, this too is remarkable. To think that today, 6.5 billion people on the face of the earth, one out of every nine people who's ever lived since the caves is on the face of the earth today. And what that not only talks about is the potential for human disease and human crowding and human closeness and the idea of the human petri plate or flask or laboratory test tube of growth, but we have to feed these people. And so all you've heard this morning in terms of the major increase in animal production is only going to continue to increase as world population increases. And so that we have this overlay now of a, an explosive situation that even a hundred years ago was nothing like this. 
and then take that 100 years and go all the way back to antiquity. That's important to understand. Now, I was asked briefly to bring us all up to speed on just influenza in general. For many in this room, it may be a, a very simplistic overview. I apologize. Uh, you've heard it before. But we want to be sure and distinguish between seasonal influenza disease versus pandemic-related disease. We still have some media uh, folks that haven't quite understood the difference. Seasonal influenza disease is the remnants of a previous pandemic. The virus strain of the last pandemic is typically the dominant strain in humans each season after the pandemic has ended. Regular seasonal influenza is a respiratory illness characterized by fever, headache, tiredness, dry cough, sore throat, runny nose, muscle aches, and occasionally, particularly in children, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. It's not foodborne disease. It's the muscle aches, et cetera. Complications occur mostly among high risk and include bacterial pneumonia, dehydration, and worsening of chronic conditions such as congestive heart disease, asthma, and diabetes. I want to distinguish this. This is not what is happening with H5 right now infection in humans. In addition, it was not what happened in 1918. Every year in this country, 5 to 20 percent of the population develop influenza, 36 percent die, or 36,000 die. That number, excuse me, not 30, uh, of, of, that, of the ones that died, basically, that number varies each year by the severity of the disease. In recent uh, studies, it's been suggested as high as 52,000 people died. If you take and extrapolate that to the world, you begin to understand that influenza every year is an important human cause of death around the world. It spreads by respiratory droplet and possibly aerosol, which for those in trying to figure out how to protect ourselves, such as masks and so forth, that becomes more important. And I think the bottom line message has been the only real approach that we've had internationally to seasonal influenza prevention has been that of trying to vaccinate up to 300 million high-risk individuals in developed world countries. That 300 million reflects largely the entire capacity to make vaccine in the world for influenza. So that has been to date our whole approach. Now to understand pandemic influenza, it's quite different. It's an epidemic that becomes very widespread and affects a whole region, a continent, or the world. Well, that's the epidemiologic definition, but that's what I just told you about with seasonal flu. In a sense, that truly is a pandemic every season when it spreads around the world in the, trop in these, in the northern hemisphere during our winter, southern hemisphere during their winter. What we really mean here, though, for pandemic influence is that when that new viral agent emerges and we see this very new kind of disease picture. And for a pandemic to occur with a novel influenza strain, three things have to happen. One, it has to become readily transmitted between humans. The cases we've seen to date in humans in Asia really are not defining about what's happened. It's just telling. Defining means is when we actually see multiple cases of transmission. I think we have seen more than we realize. We do have the Thai case, a very uh, well-written and thoughtful paper was published uh, in November in the Emerging Infectious Disease Journal from Thailand showing that at least uh, 15 different family clusters of cases have occurred there, not suggesting it was necessarily person to person, but that at least it could have been some degree of that. But where we really get concerned is when the virus changes enough so that humans themselves sustain it. Much of the discussion about agriculture-related influenza in humans has been, in some ways, I think 180 degrees off the mark. We have talked over and over again in this country how birds will not bring the infection to us, and that's absolutely true. But if you look back in previous pandemics, particularly 1918, the animals suffered when the humans became the carrier, the humans became the primary mode of transmission. It was the humans that took the virus to the domestic pigs. It was the humans that took the virus to the bird population. And one day we will become suddenly the super shedder of this and animals will suffer much more from us than we overall will have had cases accumulate in humans from animals. We also, this genetically unique situation, uh, actually there is uh, our data today showing that very few cases of this have occurred in the population. A recent study in Indonesia that I'm very well aware of, some work that Rob Webster's group has done has shown there's been very, very few asymptomatic infections with this particular strain of H5. So that in fact, we don't have it running willy-nilly. So as, uh, as Dr. Torres pointed out, we don't have the exact number for the case fatality rate, but it clearly is very high in the sense that we don't have a lot of asymptomatic infections. And the work in Indonesia, by the way, was done in the very settings where cases of H5 had actually been documented. And finally, the thing that I have to emphasize more than anything, which I still find uh, people do not grasp, pandemics are not options. We can't prevent pandemics today. Pandemics are like earthquakes, hurricanes, and tsunamis. They occur. They've occurred all the way back to antiquity. 
The first recorded pandemic is written up by Hippocrates. Clearly, from an epidemiologic reevaluation, you can see that this was influenza. In 1580, a 1580 pandemic is a classic example. We know it started in Asia, it spread to Africa and Europe and the Americas. In six weeks, it afflicted all of Europe. What's most notable, the mortality was very high here, much more like a 1918 picture. 9,000 of 80,000 residents in Rome died in three weeks. That was dramatic. In some Spanish cities were described as nearly entirely depopulated by the disease. So even very severe pandemics like a 1918 pandemic have, be, have happened before. I show you here the recognized and generally uh, agreed upon pandemics that have occurred in the last uh, 300 years. There's others that I didn't add to the list that may have been or may not have been. You can see the range is 10 to 49 years between pandemics. They average 24 years apart. There is no rhyme or reason. Anyone that tells you we're due a pandemic doesn't understand Poisson distribution statistics, meaning that we don't know. We're not due one anymore than you're due an earthquake or a hurricane. But this is what's happened in the past, and it surely would say that we could have one at any time. I put in bold three different pandemics, 1847, 48, 1889, and 90, and 1918 and 19 that all had very similar pictures of a much higher mortality with a higher mortality in previously healthy 20 to 40 year olds. And it's only now that we're going back to resurrect these kind of data to say that I believe that there have been in history, history two different kinds of influenza pandemics. There never was one influenza pandemic. That in fact, what AI ultimately results in into humans, because again, this is the ultimate source, may actually have had more than one mechanism to get to humans. These data clearly uh, demonstrate what all of you probably well already know is the fact that the 1918-19 pandemic in humans versus the 57, 58, and 68, and 69 were very different. We only really have good virologic data on this world of pandemics, even more recently only in the last year of the 1918-1919 pandemic with our ability now to resurrect that virus uh, with the ability to recover all eight of its genes. The whole area of pandemic influenza cannot be described by one single predictive risk factor, by one single uh, uh, way of saying this is what a pandemic will do. I think that there are different kinds of pandemics. As we've talked about the 1918-19 pandemic, we now know, of course, H1N1 strain, which we've grown. There are 200 million to 1 billion people were infected. Uh, I continue to see the numbers of people who died in 1918 out there in various form. I would urge you all to go back and read a paper that was published in the journal, a Bulletin of Medical History, uh, written about four years ago. Uh, and actually, a group of medical historians went back country by country, continent by continent, re-examined the 1918 data, and concluded that it was a minimum of 50 million people died, more likely 100, up to 100 million, which is interesting. It's not any different than McFarland Burnett concluded in 1930s about the situation. So this idea that 20 to 40 million, not that it's a big deal, but the fact of the matter is it was much more impactful than we've given it credit for. The other thing that was very different is a traditional influenza pandemic of those that I showed, most of those ones up there, basically have the classic U-shape mortality curve with the highest death rates in the very young and in the very old. And for most of the pandemics, including 57 and 68, basically all tides rise all boats, the rising tides rise all boats. And what happened here was, in fact, we see the overall U-shape curve just rising. That was different in 1918. And what we saw there was a classic W-shaped curve, which I'll show you in a moment, where, again, the highest mortality was in healthy 20 to 40-year-olds. Now, I don't want to jump the gun here, but start thinking about who's dying right now from H5N1 infection in Asia. Another issue that was very telling about the 1918 epidemic, there were at least 13 studies done in six different countries involving pregnant women and demonstrated a case fatality rate ranged from 23 to 71 percent with a median of 55 percent. Pregnancy is the most precarious immunologic time in a healthy person's life. In one part of you has this very precious cargo that you're trying very hard to protect, and part of you says there's something inside of me that shouldn't be there, let's get rid of it. And we know the immune system goes through a number of up and down regulated activities during pregnancy that are very unique. And was our first real suggestion that an immunologic component to this disease was very important. Then we came along 5758, for which now we could actually 
grow the virus. Uh, you've already heard by genetic, genetic reassortment, uh, we obtained five genes from the then circulating human strains, three genes from wild ducks, a much milder pandemic. In 1968-69, H3N2, that remnant strain that is still now causing our seasonal problem, two genes from a duck reservoir, six genes from a human virus through what we call classic reassortment. Which brings me to a point that I just want to cover very briefly for you in the media in a sense of saying, I can honestly tell you with great humility, I know a hell of a lot less about influenza today than I did five years ago. There were many, many parts of the influenza world that were very stable, dogma that was very well ingrained in the minds of any student who took an infectious disease epidemiology class. And today, if you don't have your eyes wide open, you don't understand influenza. I believe that there are actually several mechanisms today by which pandemic strains can emerge, and the implications are huge for which way it is. You've already heard Dr. Torres uh, give you a very nice example that occurs when a uh, reassortment occurs when an influenza virus and a human adapted virus swap genes in a co infected cell of an animal or a human, and a third virus results that can be readily transmitted by and between humans. That's the classic 57 58 model. This cartoon depicts what H5N1 might look like either in a co-infected pig cell or a human lung cell with a resultant virus. Now, I have no data to support this, none. It's a gut feeling, and I'll lay it right on the line. If this virus hasn't reassorted by now, I don't think it's going to, and I don't know why. I do not understand why. So for those who dismiss H5N1 as the future pandemic strain because it hasn't reassorted, I think they have a legitimate point. But there's another point to this message. There is another mechanism called recombination. It doesn't fit antigenic drift or shift as we typically think of it. Antigenic shift is a cataclysmic jump off the cliff, big change. Recombination is obtaining that same outcome, but through these constant gradual changes that are far more than drift itself. It's far more than just the seasonal change to change to change. Now we're talking about a result of a series of point mutations in the hemagglutin of an influenza virus the virus becomes a competent human-to-human -human transmitted agent with those changes while retaining the essential properties of the original avian virus. We now know that, in fact, in 1918, that virus jumped directly from birds to humans. We also have increasing evidence that this virus may have circulated in the bird population as early as 1900, well before 1918, so that it was acquiring these mutational changes. Think about the bird population, both wild and domestic, in 1900 and think about it in 2005. Come back to that. Jeff Taubenberger's uh, really outstanding paper in Nature which uh, d demonstrated the 1918 pandemic H1N1 jumped directly from avian species to humans and I take a quote directly from that paper. Notably, a number of the same changes that have been found in the recently circulating highly pathogenic H5N1 viruses that have caused illness and death in humans and are feared to be precursors of a new influenza pandemic. I would again suggest, as I did before, that the 1918 H1N1 virus and H5N1 are almost kissing cousins. And what is happening with that virus combination, H5N1, and what happened with 1918 H1N1 is, in fact, a very important lesson for us. And it's very different than H3N2. It's very different than H2N2. For example, in an accompanied paper in the same week that the Nature paper was published, uh, Tumpy et al. from CDC, having reconstructed the 1918 pandemic virus using reverse genetics and recovered genes, basically were able to demonstrate that this virus kills in a very different way than even the current H1N1 virus kills, and that in addition, it's very different than H3N2. What happens is you have this virus storm that occurs very early in the infection, causing levels of virus not otherwise seen in typical influenza infections. With this, as we have talked about in the past, we believe that this goes on and results in a what we call cytokine storm, an immune response. This is a cartoon from my review in the New England Journal of Medicine in May, looking at H5N1, where basically what happens is you get hit with this heavy virus load, then turns on all these cytokines or immune chemicals, which basically then turn on the rest of the immune system. And the example I've used before is, imagine somebody lights a match in a wastebasket here in this room, and one smoke alarm goes off. Imagine if you do the same thing and every smoke alarm in DC goes off. What this virus does is creates this. Why then might we see the highest rate of death 
in those 20 to 40 because who has the strongest immune systems? Those from the 20s to 40s who then have this overvigorous response with the strongest immune system going on developing acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is today largely what we're seeing with H5N1 infection among those few that get infected in Asia. To better understand 1918, this is a letter from Dr. Roy Grist, a physician who was serving at the military camps outside of Boston in 1918. He wrote this to his friend Bert. It was found in the attic of Bert's uh, family's home and published in the British Medical Journal December 1979. Uh, Dr. Grist starts out by saying, these men start with what appears to be an ordinary attack of La Grippe or influenza. When brought to hospital, they rapidly developed the most vicious type of pneumonia that's ever been seen. A few hours later, you can begin to see cyanosis extending from their ears and spreading all over the face until it's hard to distinguish the colored men from the white. It's only a matter of a few hours then until death comes. It's horrible. One can stand to see one, two, or 20 men die, but to see those poor devils dropping like flies. We have been averaging about 100 deaths per day. Pneumonia means in about all cases death. We've lost an outrageous number of nurses and doctors. It takes special trains to carry away the dead. For several days there were no coffins and the bodies piled up something fierce. It beats any sight they'd ever had in France after a battle. An extra long barracks has been vacated for the use of the morgue and it would make any man sit up and take notice to walk down the long lines of dead soldiers all dressed and laid out in double rows. Goodbye, old pal. God be with you till we meet again. Kind of a follow-up to Bill Frist's comment. This is what we saw in 1918. John Barry's outstanding book of the, describing that, I'd urge you all to look at because I think this is not just a historical book about the past, but this very well may have lessons for our future. This is what 1918 looked like, particularly in the soldiers. I would suggest today that our health care system, should a 1918-like pandemic occur again, will be no different than this. We will quickly run out of all of our medical supplies in this global just-in-time economy, everything from masks to IV bags to pharmaceutical products, many of which are made offshore, many of which have very thin and long supply chains. When borders are either intentionally or unintentionally shut down because people won't travel, we'll run out of these products. I don't know what the difference between providing care in the Hubert Humphrey Metrodome in the Twin Cities and COTS with no IVs, no ventilators, and a lack of antivirals or antibiotics is any different than 1918. There are some lessons here. This uh, particular shot is actually one of the influenza ward in Luxembourg. Anyone who knows the history of World War I knows that this particular infection played a very key role in the outcomes of World War I. Just to give you a quick sense of what 1918 was like as we look at potential human problems in the future, this is a slide from Boston showing during September, October, and November the percent of deaths for each month from 0 to 9, 10 to 19, uh, on down the line here, up to 60 to 69. As an epidemiologist, maybe most of the people were that age. That's why they died. If you look, though, from a rate standpoint where an epidemiologist would look, you begin to see something much different. This is now 0 to 9, 10 to 19, 20 to 29, 30 to 39. You can see it. This is now death rate per 100,000 people. Here is the historic data for 1912 to 1916, i.e. what had historically happened. You can see about 300 per 100,000 children died from influenza pneumonia-like illness, dropping down to almost zero in the teenagers and young 20s and then gradually coming up. Now along comes 1918, September to October. Now the chart, instead of zero or 100, 200, it's 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 5,700, and you begin to see what happened here. Went from 300 per 100,000 to 3,000 per 100,000, even in the youngest. But in the older population, almost 6% of the residents of Boston in the late teens to their mid to late 30s died in those two-month period. Quite remarkable. Again, I only point out if you look at the curve and what's happening in Asia, this same inverted V now into a W kind of situation is very, very key. This slide has been shown. But I would want to urge one thing as I conclude here, that I want to reinforce what the other speakers have said. I believe that H5N1 will make its way around the world in wild birds. I actually believe that will happen. Other bird trafficking could very well move it as humans do. But that is not the significant risk for this future pandemic to emerge. The genetic roulette table for this virus to basically continue unfettered in its mutational capability with transmission day in and day out is still here. Remember, we're harvesting birds there every day and replacing them every day in those same conditions. I can't think Darwin could not have invented a better genetic reassortment laboratory, a better genetic mutational environment than this. And so I believe that we still have to look at this. 
I, as an epidemiologist, can't tell you that H5N1 will be the next pandemic strain. There will be one. Nothing we do to prepare will be lost. There will be another pandemic. Second of all, though, if it is H5N1, which it could be, it could happen soon, it could happen a year from now, it could happen five years from now. But as an epidemiologist who's been in the trenches for 30 years, I can't understand, just like I still understand why 747s fly, they don't make sense to me. Point is, there is nothing that's going to stop this virus from continuing its mutational march. Even the recent changes of the virus going back into wild aquatic birds with this pathology we're now seeing says that this virus is continuing to march mutationally along a path we've never seen before. And as Dr. Taubenberger pointed out, I believe that everything here tells me, give this thing enough time, and even, you know, a blind hog can find an acorn occasionally. This virus will eventually have all the right mutational setup for becoming a human-to-human -human transmitted pathogen, and all it needs is one time. It doesn't need to have that happen multiple times. If we look at the death issues here, what this could be, if we estimate 30 to 60 percent of the world becomes infected, if it's a 1968-like pandemic, this still big numbers, most people would say that would be a yawner. Well, I don't know. I think the panic and fear would still be there. I think the public's response would be there. Think of 8,000 cases of SARS, 800 deaths, what it did. Think what 22 cases of anthrax and five deaths did in this community with regard to the mail service, et cetera. But if it's a 1918-like pandemic, it's more like this. If I had to give a guesstimate, I would suggest this might be it. When you say, well, that's high, there are those who out there say, well, maybe it'll keep its 50% case fatality rate, and it would be this. I don't believe that's the case. I, I believe it would dumb down in terms of its ability uh, to, to kill as it was more readily transmitted, but none of us know. None of us know. And anybody that tells you they know exactly, they don't. I, again, put my bet it could be very well a situation like this. Again, to give you a comparison, don't forget that HIV AIDS in 30 years has killed 32 million people in 30 years. If you look at the age population, if we take the 1918 data, just transpose it onto our current population of today, you can see where a big hit is at. This is 1.7 million deaths in the U.S. that could be expected with a 1918-like pandemic in a 12 to 18-month period. Uh, I might add that this is actually lower than the HHS uh, a one scenario of 1.9 million. I did the age adjusting on this, which they hadn't done the age adjusting. So let me conclude by saying, first of all, please, do not make the mistake. This is not a debate about whether pandemics will occur again. They will. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when and where it will emerge. Will H5N1 be it? We don't know, but I see nothing that would change that given the current world's bird population and the uh, very nice job that you've heard earlier this morning of describing why that continues to be a problem. Also assume we're not going to have the kinds of things that we'll need to prevent this. Vaccine will not be available for the first six to eight months, and even then it will be available in drips and drabs. The world is, does not have an infrastructure. It will take us years of dedicated resources, vision, and commitment to make that change. And again, I would even say for those who are very American-centric, which unfortunately far too many of us are, if we could even get a vaccine to protect most Americans, if the rest of the world is still overwhelmed by a pandemic, the collateral damage in this country to our economy will be huge. Finally, I would just want to mention that even if a 1918-like scenario unfolds, 98 out of 100 people will still be alive at the end of the pandemic. And one of the things that we're all trying to talk about is what happened with Katrina. If you look at the number of people that died with Katrina, it was a tragedy. But in the end, what really took us over the top was seeing what happened inside the Superdome or what happened to the survivors and the pain and suffering they went through. And I think that much of us today are working not just on trying to eventually prevent pandemic flu. I believe pandemic flu can be prevented in humans with a commitment to a worldwide vaccine development program where we could actually not only make it in a, a different way than we do today, but also get it to people. But then we today, in the short term, we have to figure out how are we going to assist in making sure that the critical products, the kinds of support we need during a human pandemic is available. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Osterholm. And now to complete this set of presentations, we're going to have uh, Dr. Lonnie King. Uh, Critical dialogues. <laughs> Critical dialogues, okay.
Thanks very much. I know how difficult it is to be the last uh, lecturer. I, I, uh, when I lecture to students and end up the day with, with the last lecture, it's not much fun, but that's what I drew today, and we'll uh, take that on anyway. Um, the, the one thing I want to say when I start, uh, I'm talking as the dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine for Michigan State University and a veterinarian, and I'm not uh, talking as a CDC employee, even though I'm at CDC right now, so I'd just like to make that straight before I, before I start uh, here. Uh, I think the other speakers have done a great job to talk about uh, the background and the consequences of, of this disease. Mike just talked about, you know, 10 pandemics uh, that we've seen in the last 300 years. But I would also suggest that today probably the world is closer to a pandemic than any time since uh, the 1968 uh, pandemic occurred. It's unknown if H5N1 is going to be the one. Uh, but like Mike, it is going to take place. The evolution is unpredictable, but it continues to move ahead. Uh, and the risk persists as long as that virus persists. And uh, one thing I want you to uh, take away from here is that this disease is endemic in poultry and birds in Southeast Asia. It is not going to go away very quickly. So pandemics do happen. That's a bumper sticker, right? I mean, it's all close to bumper sticker that I've seen around Washington, but pandemics do happen. And one of the issues is, you know, having this really unique novel virus. And we saw that in H1s and, and H3s and H2s in the past pandemics uh, last century. Uh, and then they persist over time. Uh, and if you look at the, you know, the H5 in the top, seen in Hong Kong in, in, 50, in 1997, probably been around longer than that. Uh, and it is just changing to the point that it is becoming a novel virus, uh, and that's pretty disconcerting. So the situation report today, if we did a checklist, would say widespread and spreading prevalence in migratory birds in a broad host range. You heard that, uh, I think, very well through our past speakers. Outbreaks continue in domestic poultry, certainly in Southeast Asia now, uh, moving into some other uh, areas of the world that this virus also has a propensity to jump species lines. We know that experimentally it can infect cats, uh, which is work done in the Netherlands, that uh, pigs have been actually infected in China, and so a lethal virus is indeed evolving. Uh, there's been sporadic human cases with a high case fatality rate of which we don't know for sure because people pointed out we don't know the denominator. We do not yet, do not yet have a sustained and rapid person-to-person -person transmission. But the situation report really has already taken place in um, these first few criteria. WHO has listed periods and phases of uh, kind of a checklist themselves, an interpandemic period, a pandemic alert period, and then when we actually have a pandemic. And if you look at this, uh, we've, um, we've met the criteria for phase one, we've met the criteria for phase two, we've met the criteria for phase three, uh, we haven't met the criteria yet that we know of for phase four. Uh, but that's going to be the clue. And that's going to be the shift into small clusters of human-to-human-to-human -to -human -to -human transmission. Uh, and the worst case scenario is that that clustering may very well take place in remote areas in Southeast Asia that we won't see it very quickly. Uh, and that is a real problem in terms of trying to get ahead of this. Uh, the rest of the phases go after that, but uh, we have hit phase three, uh, and we certainly have surveillance systems, I hope, that would look for a phase four. So what are the real concerns today? Well, this virus is really highly pathogenic. We talked about the different species that it can affect, and, um, and, and Dr. Osterholm gave a, a very good updating of, of what the pathology really looks like in terms of this virus. It's pretty dramatic. We know that this virus is shed through a lot of birds. We also know through um, some of the research that this virus shedding in ducks, which is really key, which is really key, because ducks tend to be asymptomatic. The virus shedding lasts longer and with more virus being shed. Movements through migratory uh, waterfowl and, and birds, Dr. Karish did a great update of how that's taking place and the system in place to, to take a look at that. Uh, and the lack of natural immunity in mammalian populations. Okay? Uh, we have a pristine populations in animals and people worldwide. Okay? Billions susceptible. Never had exposure to this pathogen in the past uh, and are extremely susceptible. 
Uh, this virus has uh, shown resistance to amanadine and rimanidine, okay? So it has already built some resistance to antivirals. Uh, we are concerned about reporting in remote locations. How quickly do we know about the spread or potential clustering of these diseases? Uh, and we're very concerned about disincentives for reporting, especially in the animal health side. There are two different systems in terms of incentivizing reporting systems. And it's very different on the agriculture side than it is on the human health side. It's a clash of cultures. Um, uh, living as a veterinarian in CDC, I see it constantly but the understanding of reporting and cultural differences, and then the significant case fatality rate. The, mic the macroeconomic consequences of the pandemic are just absolutely unprecedented. I think uh, you could get a group of economists in this room and they'd give you some pretty wild figures, but it's a pretty wild consequence. Uh, the level of global preparedness is extremely uneven to say the best. Okay? Uh, there's a lot of plans out there right now. Uh, some of them are practical, some of them are pragmatic, uh, some of them will never work. Uh, uh, and I think they really haven't been tested. And then there's this great mixing bowl of future pathogens. And I agree with Mike, the, the virtual genetic reassortment laboratory of the world is pretty dramatic. And if you look at Southeast Asia, it is the perfect mixing bowl uh, for these pathogens to merge and reemerge. Uh, there's little evidence of success in dealing with H5N1 at the non-commercial animal production level. Okay? That's why it's endemic. Okay? It's there and it's going to be there for, for a while. We're concerned about global quarantine and isolation practices. Uh, how does this translate into the 21st century? Uh, with 1.4 billion people moving internationally last year, uh, how do we put in place a quarantine and isolation system with public policy that's actually going to work. Potential widespread and inconsistent practices and policies with vaccinating poultry. Okay? Buzz didn't talk about that because he could probably, he does a good job in his own industry, but I've seen now where China wants to vaccinate all of their poultry. Uh, we want to know the quality of that vaccine. Is it covering infection? Does it really prevent infection? The answer is no. Does it prevent shedding? Probably not. Will it push this underground? Likely. Uh, and if they start using antivirals, will it become resistant? And the answer is probably yes. So while that may be somewhat of a solution, it may also be a problem. Uh, that's 4.1 billion poultry to vaccinate in China. Uh, and as Dr. Klopp would tell you, that uh, for broilers, they're such remarkable animals, they last 41 days. That's the production cycle from hatching to production. Okay? So when do you stop vaccinating? It's 4.1 billion at this point in time, but you know, two months later, it's this point in time, et cetera. So, uh, and I, the other interesting thing that we're now seeing is already changes in, in this virus. Uh, and for those of us that uh, are interested in this, um, this is, is just a little graph that we won't actually quiz you on, uh, but it really is looking at the molecular virology, right? This comes out of a colleague from CDC, and they talk about clades of viruses, and they're really just families, if you will. And already H5N1 has uh, two different clades, two different families. So the human infections that have looked at from China and Indonesia are antigenically different than human infections in other parts of Southeast Asia. Okay? For those of, uh, of you that, have, that are interested in virology, of course, with orthomyxovirus, uh, that's pretty common to see that kind of a change. The question is, uh, that's almost predictable to get those kinds of changes. Uh, where do you produce a virus? How do you produce a vaccine? What is the candidate? Okay. Are those protective if you have one and not the other? Okay. So the change conti continues to take place. And I think it's really indicative of the problem that we have in trying to prepare the right vaccine. And if you look at most plans today, they are stockpiling antivirals and producing large quantities of vaccine, of which we can't do yet today, but still trying to do that, both of which are strategies that may or may not work. So just kind of think about it uh, in, along those lines. Mike given you, I think, a, a good update in this. Uh, I think the work where, where uh, scientists actually recreated the 1918-1919 virus was unbelievable. That is a, a wonderful scientific achievement. It also gives us a checklist to monitor that virus and look and see how it actually changed. 
And Mike told you that that 1918 virus was actually a direct descent from an avian virus. Okay, and the change was uh, the, the changes that wasn't a recombination, wasn't a reassortment, but the changes of that bird virus over time that became the human virus, uh, and that is. Uh, um, a piece of information that I think is really invaluable to us because it doesn't, because because the recombinations took place in 57 and 58, but with this virus it doesn't look like that's happening, uh, and it is directly marching along, moving down the pathway to become a human virus as long as it sticks around. The Institute of Medicine uh, produced a book um, a few years back. It talked about really the the changes in. Um, uh, today in viruses that were, were moving and constantly changing, uh, and they looked at this in terms of microbial threats and looked at the metaphor of the perfect storm, the book about uh, the perfect meta meteorological conditions that uh, moved ahead to give a, a, a once-a-century kind of a storm. And that metaphor then was converted into look at what is the perfect microbial storm. And instead of occurring every 100 years, these combinations are occurring almost yearly. Relatively common occurrences, they're not like cyclones that kind of blow themselves out, but there's a new convergence model today. And there's factors of emergence that gives us an understanding of why these new diseases are emerging, of which H5N1 is only one single example. The remarkable adaptation and changes in these viruses uh, and pathogens, changes in the host susceptibility, you've heard that today, Climate and weather changes, changing ecosystems, certainly as we're trying to learn how to produce large numbers of commercial birds uh, in, in production practices where we have backyard flocks. The economic development, land use, human technologies, on and on, the breakdown of public health measures. These are the factors that we live in every day that is producing this new emergence of infectious diseases. So we have the great um, opportunity and challenge to live in a whole new epidemiologic era, which probably started maybe 25 or 30 years ago, where we now have the new viruses, the new pathogens and bacteria that are being produced are really coming from the convergence in human and animal health. Uh, we talked about this remarkable change in how quickly people move, that since 1800, there's a thousand-fold increase in the distance and speed of movement. And look at the number of people moving, 50 million visitors into the United States last year, and this tremendous global trade of food, animals, and animal products. The United Nations shows us through this picture that from 6.5 billion people today to uh, 9 to 11 billion people by the middle of the century, that most of that population increase is going to be in the less developed countries the very countries that are increasing their agricultural production systems to try to feed this huge increase in the number of people, and that's what Dr. Torres was talking about when he said Livestock 2020. So you throw into that these different pathogens, okay? And in humans, about 60% of all human pathogens are zoonotic. They come from or through animals, okay? And avian influenza is a perfect example of that. In veterinary medicine, that's not big news to us because about 80% of the pathogens we deal with are cross-species types of pathogens, right? They're ecological journalists. They're moving from species to species in order to survive, just like avian influenza. So last year, over 21 billion, okay, over 21 billion food animals were produced to help feed a population of over 6 billion people, resulting in trillions of pounds of products distributing worldwide. The great mixing bowl. And the projections of Livestock 2020 indicate that the demand for animal protein will increase by approximately 50%, especially in the developing countries. It is just perfect for the microbes. And one of my colleagues calls this the microbial club med era. It's a wonderful time to be a microbe, to be able to pass from 21 billion animals to 6.5 billion people, to move around the globe in less than 24 hours, to change and adapt. And we wonder why we only have kind of one H5 in to, or one H5 in one today. So, uh, and this is a true statement, there are more mo microbial cells in the human body than human cells. So just think about the possibilities 
if you did the mathematics of what, into the ninth and the tenth times, well, you can do the math uh, at your lunch hour. But it is a remarkable time in life where these microbes and the perfect storm are, are coming together. Just to point this out to you, this is a list of CDC's most significant global epidemics over the last decade. And I would add 2004 H5N1 because it was really starting to get going then. And maybe um, 2005 would be Marburg virus, what happened in Africa. And so your quiz today to wake you up is which of these is not zoonotic? And the answer is none. That's pretty close. Norwalk-like virus, a Khaleesi virus. Uh, so if you're on a cruise ship with a thousand of your good friends and you all get gastrointestinal problems a thousand miles offshore, uh, you have a great trip. Uh, we see all kinds of noroviruses in animals and I think it's just a matter of time to understand that that's probably zoonotic. So 11 out of the 12, okay, most significant global epidemics in the last 12 years are zoonoses. Okay? So those are part of the world in which we live and it's uh, pretty typical of what happens in H5N1. Dazizek had published this in Science, and this is just to remind you again of what you've heard this morning, and that's this remarkable interface of wildlife. Dr. Karish talks so much about our domestic animal populations that Buzz talked about, the human populations that Mike talked about, and that remarkable interface that's in the middle, right, producing 11 out of the 12 last pathogens, uh, and the perfect storm is set up and will continue. You heard about this shift and this wonderful epidemiologic triad of host, agent, uh, and environment, and you got examples all morning of that. I would suggest that you would extend that into a new model, and that new model is an extension of kind of the social group, the ecological group, and the global factors. Uh, and that's really the extension of the context of the host, agent, and environment. And it's probably appropriate uh, at this institute when we move from science and technology into policy analysis and politics. And that shift is where a lot of the attention is taking place today. Remarkable implications for these diseases, not only in morbidity and mortality, but politically, socially, economically, psychologically. We look at BSE in the United Kingdom and environmentally. So we have new agriculture, this new interdependence, if you will, and a new paradigm where agriculture is now global, uh, a word that Thomas Fried uh, used in his book, uh, The World is Flat, that this is no longer lo uh, local or global, we're all mixed together, and he calls them glocals. A remarkable global food system that's transporting animals and animal products, viruses and bacteria and rickettsia and parasites at the same time, uh, macroeconomics, uh, this uh, livestock 2020, and new emerging zoonoses. So great implications for agriculture, H5N1 poultry outbreaks are the largest and the most severe on record. Death or destruction of an estimated 150 million birds resulting in severe economic impact, not in the United States, but we've learned our lessons here. And the virus is considered an endemic part of Southeast Asia and the control of the disease in poultry will take years. So what did we learn about letting a virus just linger over time? As it changes, as it evolves, you're giving it the greater probability of moving closer and closer toward a pandemic. Just real quickly on the reality checkpoints. So this is an endemic disease, okay? That we have to understand the dynamic and the interface between our domestic animals, our wildlife, and the human interface. That is the activity that we need to understand. So those three different groups cannot work in isolation. So the problems, can, uh, the solutions can't focus on a single aspect of that problem. Avian influenza is a serious problem for the poultry industry already. It deserves attention and work because it is a serious problem in the poultry industry and the macroeconomics of that industry. We have a remarkable clash of cultures between animal and public health working separately, not understanding each other, right, at the very time that that work has to come together. And the great complexity of throwing in, if you will, these multi-host pathogens in the middle of all these great populations. Uh, and as um, 
uh, the world is flat book had talked about the reconciliation of looking at 9-11, which is how do you protect populations and isolate them, versus the global food system, which is 11-9-89 when the, when the Berlin Wall fell, where we really had globalization to take place. How do we live in both worlds? Commercial poultry production and backyard flocks and wild birds are the critical dynamic. And if there's one thing you need to do when you walk out of here today is to remember H5N1 is an animal disease. Okay? It's an animal disease. Right? It is typical of what we're seeing today in these zoonotic infections that take place. Can it become a human disease? Yes, it can. Okay? But look and see where the attention is being focused in terms of resources and planning in the future. Okay? Mostly on the human health side, which I understand and I appreciate but nothing at the root cause. Nothing at reducing the pathogen load where we need to reduce it. The scope and scale and implications are unprecedented, that this is a single example of a zoonotic disease over the last 30 years of which we're seeing more and more, and the factors that are in place unabated for this to continue. And these regional problems become our local problems. I'm not going to go through these because these are really about cultural changes around the world that bring animals and people even closer together than we've even seen in the United States. Uh, and my colleagues have already looked at these in terms of fighting cocks and the way animals are used and the human-animal bond and the people's connections with this. And I think I'll just go directly then to some three slides and the solutions and we'll end it. Uh, I kind of like this paraphrase of Albert Einstein, said, we cannot solve today's complex problems adapting the same level of thinking we use when we created them. And that's so true. There's probably even a better one, which is the H.L. Uh, Mencken quote, who was the editor of the Baltimore Sun, who basically said, for every complex problem, there's always a simple, neat solution. It's usually always wrong. So when we talk about how in the world are we going to come to grips with these dilemmas today, the answer is that we can, but it's a different way of thinking and acting than we've seen before. It's the integration of animal health, public health strategies and actions, not separate, okay? Not looking at a congressional bill that moves to one side and not another, right? But the integration together. So you've certainly seen that and heard that from every speaker today. Reconciling animal agriculture production systems as they change in developing countries to feed 10 billion people by the middle of this century, and how are we going to do that in a way that has biosecurity, right, that continues to increase animal proteins and do it in a safe way. So we heard a lot about implementing biosecurity. It does work. Buzz showed us in his industry that it works. It does work, by the way, in countries in Southeast Asia. They can produce birds and they can live uh, in endemic areas and, and do it successfully. We have to build infrastructures in our health systems in developing countries not just public health, but also animal health. Okay? And I think that uh, Billy Carries did a good job of understanding that our wildlife populations are a critical part of that infrastructure. And we have to include them into surveillance systems and part of the strategy. Vaccines and antivirals are important responses. They're not long-term solutions. Okay? And I think um, maybe our solutions, when we look at plans, have changed since Katrina uh, just because of the response that, we, that people expect from the government versus what we really can do to be effective here. Global surveillance of domestic poultry, wildlife, and humans. Where is that data being shared? Okay. Where do we understand these changes that are taking place? How do we reduce the pathogen load of susceptible populations? That's the crux of the issue. How do we reduce the pathogen load for susceptible populations? Okay. Exposure experiences. Okay. That can be done, uh, and that is certainly one of the key strategies. Public-private partnerships at the source, okay. whether it's McDonald's or Yum Industries or Cargill, who are raising birds around the world. Okay. Uh, there's some great uh, public-private partnerships that I think are, are really working. Fighting this problem Fighting the disease in poultry is a public health strategy. Fighting this disease in poultry is a public health strategy. And the reason is that it's a reduction of the pathogen load. Okay. Uh, national plans have to be pragmatic. They, uh, 
pragmatic and they have to be tested. Um, combine short and long-term actions. And I would also suggest that even Southeast Asia is the great melting pot. Uh, I hate to tell you how many birds are being produced right now in Brazil. And if you want the future to see hit in the side of the head because you never see it coming, right? Um, what's happening with virus changes there? Huge increases in commercial production, not only for South America, but for the United States. Okay. So it's not just uh, one, one place. Implement prototype projects in developing agricultural systems and build on best practices, including how do you incentivize people to report and do something at the agricultural uh, point. Can be done, and it does work. And a comprehensive understanding and strategies based on the convergence of human and public health. Already being started in Europe in a, um, a strategy called MedVetNet. We're spending about 14, billion, 14 million, I wish it were billion, about 14 million euros in developing strategies for research uh, and programs at the interface of human and animal health and wildlife. Because they see that that nexus is really critical then to our future success. Needs to be done in the United States as well. With, uh, with those solutions, I'll uh, stop and thank you very much for your attention. Terrific. Thank you very much, Lonnie. We've obviously been blessed with a, a tremendous amount of expertise and, and information. I'd ask all our speakers to come up. We'd, we are going to run a little late, and I'll apologize to all of you, but I think we've, we've benefited greatly from these rich presentations. I do want to capture just a couple questions, and then we'll give our panelists an opportunity for a last uh, set of response. So uh, if you could let us know, uh, the gentleman over here on the side, and then we'll go to the back. Crystal, for the second one. Yeah, I'm David Brown from the Washington Post. Um, I'm wondering, this is mostly, I guess, to Dr. Osterholm, uh, if in fact the difference between pandemic and seasonal influenza is prior exposure in terms of its, you know, its, its danger to human populations, and it's certain that for the next 10 years at least uh, there's going to be egg-based vaccine production, why is there not greater attempt or uh, consideration of dropping one of the components in the seasonal flu vaccine, probably the B component, and putting an H5N1 in for the next four or five years? Okay. Chris, uh, Charlotte, could you take it to the lady all the way in the back in the, the teal or whatever color? Hi, Joanna Broder, Bangor Daily News. Um, I just wanted to ask, what are the chief concerns in terms of the, the poultry industry within the United States? Okay. Uh, Jim Yasman from uh, USAID Office of Agriculture. One of the things that hasn't been mentioned here today um, in terms of uh, poultry and, and livestock and even crop genetics in general is the tremendous narrowing of the genetic base of, uh, of agriculture. And uh, if you look at that map that was uh, shown of Southeast Asia, I would bet, I can't, I can't uh, you know, prove this, but I would bet that of those 14 to 16 billion birds that are produced in Southeast Asia, including China every year, you probably have three or four parent lines. So that's an extremely narrow base, and I think that, that needs to be discussed in terms of um, the future of dealing with these, uh, these endemic diseases that become uh, pandemic. Ma'am, in the purple, and I apologize for going quickly, but I just want to capture a bunch, and then we'll give our folks an opportunity to respond. Hi, I'm Nellie Bristol. I'm a freelance journalist. Have there been any cases caused through consumption of poultry, and how long does a virus live after the host is dead? Is it killed through refrigeration or heat? Technical question, gentleman, the time here, please. Could you, <coughs> yeah. Could you comment on uh, indemnity programs for... Uh, growers in terms of the relation of uh, controlling avian influenza. Mm -hmm. Oh, Walter Bocce, uh, Center of Excellence for Poultry Science, University of Arkansas. Okay. John? Joe Dudley, EAI. Uh, the press here hasn't, hasn't covered it much that the uh, press in the UK raised an interesting issue which has great bearing on, on Dr. Klopp's presentation also what Billy and Dr. Osterholm were talking about, in that the, the, the manager of the UK bird facility, the privately owned quarantine facility where the H5N1 outbreak occurred, 
also worked a second job at a major public hospital where he was the um, mechanical engineer at the hospital. So for three weeks in which we had an outbreak running in the facility there, this gentleman was commuting between his workplace at the hospital, 840 bed hospital, processes about 800 out outpatients daily according to the hospital's own website, and a workplace with an undetected outbreak of a potentially lethal zoonotic disease. Had this person had a second job at a poultry farm, uh, we could have had an equally devastating scenario on the agricultural end. We need to look into, on the importation quarantine side, not just where the animals are moving, but where the people are moving between the facilities, as was pointed out with the commercial per poultry production. Thank you. Okay, terrific. I want to uh, just make sure that those who haven't had a chance to ask questions, okay, if we could do those final three, then the gentleman in the white, and the, the brown, and the lady in the red, and then we'll give our panel a chance. Yeah, please. Uh, Will Amatruda Catholic University. Uh, in view of what we know about the spread of BSC, how much thought has been given uh, to uh, education and preventive measures to make sure that poultry that die before they get to market are kept out of, the, of the, both the animal and the human food chain. Okay, terrific. And then journalist, please. Yeah. Hi, uh, Amy Nucci of Revolution Health News. Um, I have a question for Dr. King specifically. Uh, you mentioned the poultry farming practices in Brazil and South America. I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more about that and how that would impact us. And uh, secondly, uh, given the excellent biosecurity measures, it's pretty much established that the birds themselves aren't a risk for turning the virus into a human-to-human -human type of virus. I'd like to know what would uh, probably lead that to happen and what people can do on a day-to-day -day basis to kind of protect themselves from that. Thank you. Terrific. And just a final question here, ma'am. Uh, my first question will be uh, on the poultry, and uh, every time when influenza uh, infection, uh, not infection, but in uh, prevention, and uh, we always need uh, millions and millions of eggs, and this year I know around the Atlanta, according to the councils of poultry and eggs productions, they lost uh, about 500 lots, et cetera, of the bra uh, brawlers and eggs. I wonder, would that be set back? for NIH, for example, to produce vaccines for either H5N1s uh, or uh, for the influenza, the annual influenza uh, immunization, because lose of the eggs production. That's my first question. And second question I'd like to ask is, I'm very interested in cytokine production. And you mentioned about cytokine production will be the profile is different. So can that relate it to what cytokine we're talking about, Th1 type, Th1, Th2, or you talk about other accessory cells, for example, uh, dendritic cells or macrophage or whatever. And are they specific enough that the field NGOs can pick it up and use it as a technical help as to look at, let's say, what kind of diagnostic we can use that from ELISA, for example. Is that to that level yet? Okay. Buzz, why don't we start with you and just work our way down the, the right. road. Uh, I'll, I'll try to tackle the, the subjects that uh, were addressed to me. And the chief concerns as far as uh, threats to the uh, poultry industry, uh, I really believe that the, the movement of the, the undisciplined movement of birds through the United States is a huge concern. Uh, and notice I used the word undisciplined uh, because there is some very disciplined movement of birds outside the integrated poultry system that goes on. And if I could leave you with one action to take uh, that still relates to chief concerns is that the next time you go in a restaurant or a grocery store, 
and you see free range poultry on the menu or on the counter, that you not only decline to buy it, but that you also say to the proprietor that free range outdoor access poultry represent a major disease threat to the United States poultry industry and potentially a human health issue. So if you carry that message out, I, would, I really would appreciate it. The issue of genetic basis, um, we're very concerned about that. In our industry, we've seen, we've gone from uh, seven or eight genetic suppliers down to <laughs> literally one, maybe two on the outside. Uh, how that interacts with uh, avian influenza, it, it's questionable at best because we're dealing with a naive population. Uh, which leads me to the other point that was raised about, about the immunization of, of poultry. Uh, we have had lots of discussions about immunization of poultry and uh, all the discussion that has evolved out of that has always been in the context of eradication and stamping out of the disease because vaccination for influenza, this is not something we as an industry want to accept and we will not accept it readily at all. Uh, now the, the issue of virus survival in the, in the, uh, in the meat, uh, there's been a lot of experts that have commented on this and uh, number one is that uh, as an industry we make and will make even more concerted efforts to detect these infected if an infected flock occurs in the field that it not arrive in the processing plant. You know, it's nothing is 100% but uh, it is something that we, we are concerned about, we work at, and uh, uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily like to say it, but uh, cooking goes a long way for, toward preventing a lot of things. So I, I would kind of leave it at that. Uh, indemnity dollars, uh, I mentioned about emergency disease plans that we have and the necessity for quick action. Uh, my company as an integrated uh, chicken company owns the chickens. It's our dollars that buy the chickens, feed the chickens, process the chickens. Uh, we have contract producers who raise for us. As part of uh, emergency disease plans, there are both industry, state, and federal indemnity plans that all interact here. And there is protection for our contract producers that they would receive uh, income in the event of the necessity for humane depopulation of, of their flocks. Uh, indemnity is critical because if you don't have an economic incentive, uh, there's, there's too much for the, 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 the tendency of shoot, shovel, and shut up to go on. And that's happened decades ago, but it's a concerted effort to eliminate that. Uh, the biosecurity issue of jobs and homes, uh, we try as much as we can except our, our, our human relations people get on us because we don't want people, uh, you know, working in our operations that have backdoor uh, outside poultry and this sort of thing, which you can only control human uh, behavior so far. The education question was a very good one. All these questions were good, but I should have touched more on the education aspects of, of what we've try to do as an industry in terms of informing our contract producers, in terms of uh, informing our employees, our customers, and our customers' customers. So, but this is something that, that we need to do more of, and it's, it's a very good point. I, I'm glad that question came out because it's something we're make a, making a concerted effort to do. I hope that answers my points. Thank you, Mark. Just uh, a few of these kind of eclectically, the, uh, Buzz talked about the narrow genetic pool. We also have a problem in terms of ge uh, geographic concentration. If you look at how livestock uh, and poultry are produced, they really are produced in, um, as Buzz gave a nice picture of the, of the 10 states, uh, you know, look how uh, hogs are produced and show you where those states are and, and where are those kinds of areas are, um, uh, have that geographic concentration adds to uh, greater susceptibility as well. And we've been kind of spoiled in the United States. We've been able to produce uh, livestock and poultry for characteristics of, of producing fast and producing more and not uh, uh, really populations that have a lot of disease resistance. Uh, and that's what's happening today in trying to, I think, uh, produce enough protein f uh, worldwide. Um, in terms of uh, Brazil or other, other areas, uh, I, I mean, you know, what's happening is that agribusinesses are really taking advantage of other growing areas throughout the world. Uh, and sometimes we get focused on one area where there's a problem, 
uh, and don't understand, well, this biosecurity and, and these zoonotic disease problems are going to occur in other places. And as um, uh, other parts of the world increase their uh, global food supply and their production systems, the same kinds of things that take place. So the commercial industry that uh, is uh, you know, connected with nexus in terms of backyard kinds of production systems can occur other places than Southeast Asia. And that was just uh, an example. Um, I think somebody told me yesterday that there was as many Kentucky Fried Chicken outlets in China as there are in the United States. So you know, the production practices worldwide are moving and, and shifting. Um, your, your question about uh, vaccines in terms of egg-based vaccines, it seems like uh, one of the futures is moving not only to cell lines to produce uh, antigens, but producing non-cell line antigens. And that's the, to look at uh, new ways of biotechnology to actually grow antigens in bacteria uh, and uh, grow them uh, and scale them up to the point uh, that you don't use eggs or cell line. Uh, so there are new things that are taking place right now. I think. Um, you know, having 20-year-old kinds of production, 30-year-old production practices for this problem is probably not the answer today. Uh, and the last point I'll make and turn it to Mike is just the indemnity issue. Uh, that is something we can certainly uh, do and have done in the United States. Uh, but what are we going to do to poor countries like Laos and Indonesia and Vietnam? You know, what's going to be the incentive for people to actually report uh, where there's not even money, basic money for an infrastructure? Uh, so that is part of the answer, but it's uh, part of the problem as well. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, in terms of the first question, David, you asked about uh, the incorporation of H5 antigen into the current trivalent vaccine. Actually, it, you know, at first blush, it makes a lot of sense uh, in terms of just if you believe that there really is a risk there. The problems we have with that right now is the fact that the different mic. Sorry, is it the mic? Yeah. Okay. Is that of course we have not worked out the actual antigen requirements per se. And as you know, the initial NIH studies actually were a good news, bad news situation where we had the good news that yes, using a last year's strain from a human, we could actually mount what we believe is a protective immunologic response in normal human hosts. The problem is it took 12 times as much antigen to do that. And our limiting factor, of course, in making influenza vaccine is the amount of antigen harvest out of the current egg production system. So that one of the things before you'd even consider putting H5 into the current vaccine, if it is going to be a two-dose regimen, if it really is going to be that high level, how would you even begin to incorporate that into the current system? So this thinking, though, that where, where you asked the question is right on target. We need to be looking at that issue and figuring out, you know, would we give up H1N1? Or, you know, how, what would we do there to really begin looking at that issue? And I know that that discussion is ongoing, but we need more data. Uh, the question you asked are relative to cytokines and so forth. Um, I don't see any, uh, how should I say, it, useful uh, implementation of cytokine testing in this area. Frankly, from a diagnostic standpoint, it's a very difficult test to to use. It's one that uh, basically clinically you're already going to know if somebody has acute respiratory distress syndrome, you know, whether they have which cytokines up regulated, down regulated. It is, by the way, all of the uh, various arms of with the cytokine storm. It's ep it is epithelium cells, it's, it's uh, dendritic cells, it's macrophages, it's activated T cells, it's all of them that we see. And that's why, again, I come back, not because 1918 was such a bad scenario, therefore I'm gravitating towards that, but everything about H5N1 tells me it's just like 1918 H1N1. All the principles, all the characteristics of the virus storm, the cytokine storm, all of that's there. I might add that there was a paper published uh, about two weeks ago by Malik Parrish and the group out of Hong Kong, which confirmed the cytokine storm phenomenon, which the H5N1 that we talked about. So, I mean, it's all come together. That's what makes me nervous about this, is that everything tells me that these two viruses have so many similarities. I would add one last piece. One thing, the, the unknown we don't know. Remember I showed you that W-shaped curve, and I talked about the mortality rate's the highest in those who have the, likely the strongest immune systems. There is one clinker to that, and that is in 1918, a lot of immune compromised people didn't live very long because, in fact, they died early in life from whatever caused it. If they had cancer and they were immune compromised, they died early into that. Uh, if they had HIV-like infection, which, of course, didn't exist in 1918, but if they had that condition, they would die early in life. 
What we don't know is, is that the next pandemic, if it were a cytokine-inducing agent, it could very well have a dramatic impact on the healthiest of us, but then also have a subsequent impact on those who are immune compromised with the secondary bacterial infections, the kind of classic influenza picture we see. And again, I come back to the fact that one of the areas that I think that we have done very little about that is one of the most critical parts is this critical product continuity. If you look today, you know, we have major antibiotic shortages already. We, you know, most, many of the pharmaceutical products that we rely on every day are made offshore. Last summer, we went through a period where a very critical pediatric oncology drug was not available because one plant, the one that made it in the world, went down. Um, and so I can come back to the fact that a 1918-like experience today might be different because we have so many immune-compromised people. So maybe we'd, we'd hit across the board. We'd hit the healthiest and we'd hit the weakest simultaneously with two totally different mechanisms. That's a very scary thought. Alfonso or, or uh, really? I just want to make a, a, an additional comment on the narrowing of the domestic animal genetic base. Uh, I've been working for many, many years on all uh, animal diseases that are not in the United States, the four animal diseases. And we, what we see around the world is a little bit more morbidity, a little bit more mortality as the narrow, the genetic of the animals becomes so common. All the pigs look alike because we want to have the pork chops exactly the same size and everything else. The production practices are that require the animal exactly the same size. So we have lost a lot of domestic animals, breeds, and we are just down to a very, very few. So if we're lucky and getting the genetic makeup that these animals have more resistance, fine. But on the other hand, we can be unlucky and find more mortality and more morbidity in those cases. So I, I am concerned about that, and it's one of the factors being raised as potential for even emerging of, of, of newer diseases because of that narrowing of the genetic base. Uh, I wanted to make a comment about the, the separation between us, uh, hospital workers and, and uh, uh, animal uh, holders. And uh, just to use an example, uh, uh, the Plum Island Animal, animal Disease Center, where I was director of for many years, uses that practice. That is, no one can own uh, certain animals. Everybody's quarantined for five days in contact with, with animals. I think the poultry industry is doing that. Nobody can own pet birds or go dog hunting and so forth. I think that we need to be more aware of what are the potential interconnections of people in the off hours and, and, and be more conscious through education about that. Absolutely. Okay. Well. <clears throat> I think all the questions have been answered. Um, but I did want to just comment on the Albert Einstein quote. And I think from this morning's questions and some of these questions and about moving forward, um, and there was a question from your uh, GAO co colleague about why didn't the National Wildlife Health Center, you know, they've been trying this for years. And I think the Einstein quote probably fits. You know, we've gotten into these problems because the the separation and the mechanisms we've built for decades. And so just doing more of that is not the solution. We really have to come up with um, more solutions to bring people together. And I can't say strongly enough that investing overseas rather than sitting here and hunkering down and waiting for some, something to be lobbed in um, is a really good use of money to go reach out. And if we really want to project our power from the United States, we can project our intellectual resources, our skills that we've learned from making mistakes in the past, um, our scientific resources and our financial resources to really get the problem under control uh, before it arrives here. Thank you. Terrific. Well, can, I, can I add one last piece? I just I, I thought of something here because I don't want the audience to walk away with an impression that because Buzz made a comment and he comes from a a private sector company that has a proprietary interest in this, that he is an isolated uh, voice. I believe that the single greatest risk to the amplification of the H5N1 virus, should it arrive in the United States via wild migratory birds, will be in free-range birds. Free-range birds have been a problem for some time. The rates of salmonella are higher. The rates of Campylobacter infector are higher. It's a bigger problem, and yet it's often sold as a healthier food, which to me is a great ruse on the American public. And so as somebody from a public health background who deals with food safety often who would want to uh, not have any relationship uh, professionally or personally with Buzz or his company, I just want to make it clear that I too <laughs> have those same concerns. And I think that uh, unfortunately uh, far too often when the industry says that it's just 
basically discount it as just trying to you know cover your own. And it, from a public health pr perspective, it makes perfect and absolute sense. And just as a follow-up of that, any practices that we do to prevent salmonella from uh, chicken products will also inactivate or destroy the avian influenza right. if it's there. Okay. So just proper sanitation cooking practices will take care of that. So that, that should not be a concern. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all very much. Thank you particularly to Dr. <laughs> To, to Dr. Torres and, and Cornell University. Um, it's been uh, a terrific program. I apologize going over, but I think you will all agree with me that it was well worth um, uh, the extra time to get through everything that we did. Uh, please follow up with us on the website. We'll have an extensive uh, review and resources and PowerPoints there uh, for your use. So thank you all very much. Good to see you. Good to see you. So I don't know, a couple hour, an hour here. Um, I, uh,